the general practitioner. Uh, Dr. Fatma has worked with me um, and we've also had uh, sort of a uh, pleasure of knowing each other. She's one of our faculty and she'll be doing some sessions with us. Also, I've got Dr. Omara, Dr. Omara Israr. Uh, thank you, Omara, for joining in. And she'll be doing some sessions with you. Um, and I've got Dr. Saman. Uh, and uh, Dr. Saman is very enthusiastic and very passionate about AMC Clinical. So we'll all be doing sessions with you. But before I actually start, I want to go through and uh, um, basically give a little bit of introduction about the course. There's so many different questions which have been coming. And I've been trying to keep myself up and trying to answer them as much as I can. So if you ha guys have got any questions, you can probably ask them now, um, or maybe at the end of the session, you might like to ask questions. I don't mind really. Um, so I'll start off with our uh, little introduction. I've already introduced my faculty. My name is Rizwan Qureshi. I'm the director and uh, emergency focus. Uh, we've been doing AMC clinical stuff for a while now. Um, and uh, we also do clinical orientation course, in-person courses with the Liverpool Hospital Workshop. It's been an excellent and amazing journey. You know, in all the IMGs, being the IMG myself, I think it has taught uh, me and all of the rest of the faculty um, new ways of dealing with the problems and how to address them and make it more focused and more sharp to address your needs. Um, so what are we going to do today? All right, so there's the organization. We're going to do some exam scenarios. Um, we're going to talk about the AMC clinical exam. We're also okay. going to talk about, uh, uh, when we're also going to talk about uh, planning, how to plan your exam, uh, how to pass your exam, what are the top reasons to fail, how to communicate when you're doing the exam session, and we'll go through some of the questions and answers if you've got any. All right. Okay. And as most of you would know, AMC is about to open up the dates for 11th of November for eligible candidates. That's for AMC clinical exam. So if you're eligible, please do, do apply for dates. Don't wait up. Don't think that you're not ready or anything like that. Please do apply for the dates and get on the bandwagon. All right. Um, Okay, so uh, let's just go through a couple of slides very quickly. Um, uh, I'll just make it very simple. I don't know what the level of different participants are. Some of you might be very fresh. Some of you might be quite professional, <laughs> but I'll just go through the exam nitty gritty. Look, the exams, it's pitched or allegedly pitched at the level of the final year medical students, uh, but it asks more than that. It, it questions or it interrogates rather more than just a final year level student, or maybe the final year medical student level over here is uh, just too much. Um, so basically, I think the exam, even though is um, at final year medical student level, but I think it is more at a resident level, because that's where you'd be applying for jobs. And that's what uh, the assessment is at. And certainly you have been given pass or fail based on the final year, uh, based on the uh, resident level. Um, the other thing is that uh, in terms of dates, there have been a significant backlog because of the COVID situation all up till now. And in you know, about 10 days and two weeks time, we'll have more dates coming in. And I think next year is going to be an excellent year. So if you're planning to do your AMC clinical, there'll be lots of date, both in person and online. So grab whatever you can. I think I online, I would grab prefer. whatever you can. And online is just from the convenience of your own home. You don't have to book a hotel. You don't have to go. And I think it probably helps with the anxiety level as well when you're doing online. May, might be more for some people. Um, the exam is 16 session, as you know, um, and uh, you're assessed, uh, uh, marked on 14 and uh, two are pilot. And I said that you must uh, pass all of the station, even though the pass is 10, you should have this temperament uh, that I need to pass all 16 of them, including the pilot, doesn't matter. All right. So this should be your, uh, you know, uh, aim. Uh, and uh, certainly through our courses, that is what we try to do. Um, in terms of the scenarios, you know, they're all clustered around the very common topics of medicine, surgery, ONG, PEDS, mental health in both GP, I think predominantly general practice and hospital setting. Um, in all 
age groups and across all demographics, Aboriginal, um, you know, Islanders, uh, Australian population. So you need to make sure that you have got a cultural understanding when you're communicating to all these different demographical groups. Um, the scenario is linked with a task which might be in the form of history taking exam, diagnostic management and counseling. And that's where the communication framework is really very handy. And that's what we're trying to hone. We, nine, we, we basically, I basically think that the knowledge is there, but it needs to be channeled in a way where you tick all the tasks in that time frame so that you're not leaving anything behind and you're not leaving anything for the examiner to not pass you. Um, in terms of the marking schema, you've all seen that marking schema. It's basically based on the task. Um, you need to complete uh, the key steps which are linked to the scenario. Uh, there might be some critical errors uh, and uh, the critical errors are an automatic fail. So basically if you don't uh, um, tick, uh, for instance, if it's a pulmonary embolus scenario and you don't ask about the travel history, use of the hormones or any other risk factors related to venous thrombobolic disease, that'll be automatic fail. And in our courses, we actually do make a point of that, that all of our scenarios are linked with these landmines of critical errors. If you don't tick that, we're not gonna pass you. So based on this ideology, we put you in a hot seat from day one. All right. Uh, there are domains of assessment um, in terms of, uh, you know, all those domains in terms of, uh, uh, you know, assessment, in terms of diagnostics, in terms of management, uh, in terms of communication. And uh, we'll go through some of these, obviously, today during that uh, session, the trial session. Um, I think it takes about uh, 12 weeks to prepare. Remember, your target is to pass all stations. And uh, it's, you should not compromise on this target, all right? And the reason or the task to do that is to have a routine, a routine that you can easily follow. So if you give yourself 12 weeks, be engaged in the course, the course is just a highway and you're driving a car in that, on that highway, okay? You're learning along that highway but you have to still drive your study. You still have to maintain the regularity, okay? Um, 10 to 12 weeks is an average time to prepare and uh, you must prepare for the exam from day one. It's not a passive study. So don't make this crucial mistake that it's a reading exam. I'm going to do the theoretical reading. I'm going to attend the courses which are just uh, teaching me some theoretical stuff and then I'll start practicing. You must practicing practice from day one. If you're not practicing for day one, you're not preparing for day one. That 12 week rule does not apply to you. But if you're practicing from day one, I can certainly vouch for you that you are practicing for the real exam and you are going to be ready at about 10 to 12 weeks time. If you're getting the proper feedback, you're getting the collegiality from all of your participants and it'll just going to come natural to you. Uh, make sure that your courses are not long hours. Some of the courses I've seen, they go on forever. Have you seen that, Dr. Omar? They go on for like uh, uh, five hours or six hours. I think the learning value dilutes. And uh, yeah. I never do my sessions more than three hours, including a half an hour break in between. So the learning is, uh, there's a certain le level of osmosis. And after that, you become quite saturated, especially if you're doing a session, which is an interactive scenario. So uh, make sure that I don't, I don't recommend uh, any course. Uh, obviously, I'll recommend my course. But if you're attending any other course, make sure that you're attending a course which is not going on for very long hours. Three hours more than enough. Make sure it's um, got fairly paced uh, breaks in between. It is a scenario-based learning. It is a practical learning. So make sure that you uh, get not more than three hours in that. And that goes on for any course or online interactive learning module. All right. Um, in terms of books, Handbook of Clinical Assessment is like uh, one of the most important books that you must go through. But um, in terms of preparation from the handbook, I do tell my candidates, read the scenario and then do the scenario. Sit in front of the mirror, sit in front of your colleague, a practice buddy, and do that scenario. So it back actually becomes consolidated. Reading is not the way to prepare for AMC clinical, period. Please remember that. 
you cannot read and pass this exam. Yes, you can practice and pass this exam. And that's what you need to do. There are some other notes in terms of Jay Murta, Karen. Um, and obviously there are some YouTube videos. What uh, we have actually done, and, and the resources are huge, don't get me wrong. This humongous and mammoth task of going through from one website to other website to guidelines. I've actually made it online course now. So our AMC online clinical course, which all of our AMC clinical course participant will get, has got videos with the sessions, with the notes, with the guidelines. So you don't have to engage and disentangle from yourself, uh, yourself from one screen to the other, downloading that guideline, talking to that person, can you send me this, can you send me that? It's just one stop shop. You open the scenario, you do the scenario and immediately related to all that scenario, there's learning down between in our online AMC clinical module. It is through Thinkific platform. Um, some of you may know Thinkific platform. Um, I've already got course up and running there called Med Medical Career Guidance Course. It's a very good platform and um, it's, it's, it's got a video and then it's got a text and I've also included some flashcards in it. At the end, I've also included some download content in it and you get an access in a drip form, meaning that you'll whoever's coming to our course uh, will do the cluster of pediatrics. You'll have the pediatrics note available for you, just like an assignment, right? So you go through that assignment, you do this in an assignment and then uh, you get the next cluster, which might be ONG, might be psychiatry, medicine, surgery and so forth. So it's a very proactive way of preparing yourself. Okay, so we're gonna start scenarios soon. And this is what I want you to focus on. So outside and inside is now two minutes and eight minutes, okay? So when I give you a, a scenario, I want to read, uh, I want you to read the scenario obviously and read the task carefully. I often say that read the question after you read the task because question might be lengthy. There might be more information in the question. You might start panicking halfway through the question, not being able to understand. Reading the task may actually help you direct and fish out the important information in the scenario. And when you're reading, what are you really doing? You're actually sieving out an information in terms of diagnosis, differentials, and planning how you're going to do that task. Be it a teaching task, be it an examination task, history examination, differentials management, whatever it is. You need to use those two minutes to plan all of that. Does it make sense? Okay, good. Um, and when you're starting your eight minutes, train yourself mentally. I'm in there for seven minutes. And the last minute is just going to be my summary, question, information, danger, red flags, and any of the questions that the you know, the actor might have. Introduce yourself, make sure the patients are comfortable, had had any adequate analogies here. Take the consent, stability, that's at all a part of rapport building. Your framework is crucial and that rapport should be imbibed in that framework. You go through all the components of the history. If the scenario in particular is asking you to take history, there might be a landmine or a critical error in a past medical history, which is linked to the present history. There might be a critical error in allergies or social history. So you need to tick all the component, history of present illness, past medical history, drug history, social history, allergies, all of that. All right. And some of the components might be a bit more important. And there's a very good way of doing that very fast. You don't have to spend three minutes, four minutes just on history taking. You can move on very fast because why? Because, because you've actually planned your diagnosis, your differential and tasks outside. You already know what the scenario is. In fact, let me tell you this straight up. All of you know what the scenario are. The tasks are not difficult. The Dr. Umara has just passed the exam, online exam, and she can vouch for that. The scenarios are actually quite easy. It's actually the task. What do you think, Dr. Umara? What do you say about that? Have you got anything to add in that? What about the clinical scenario? Are they easy or hard? Yeah. All right. Um, where were we? So in terms of management, general, and specific treatment, we go through that um, kind of... Uh, Framework, yeah, I totally gentlemen. agree. When you when you see the question, you can tell that this is yeah. I think that uh, when you see uh, 
I think Dr. Umara's session is uh, sort of uh, lagging behind. That's okay. We'll get you on that. Uh, we go through the management and at the end, Squid. Did anybody watch Squid Games? You know, I binge watched that. <laughs> but anyway, yes. remember Squid Games. All right. So, uh, but mind you, this Squid approach that we've devised, Omara, this is more earlier than that. <laughs> this is earlier than Squid Games. So basically, it's summary of what you've done. Questions, answered, information, and danger signs. Okay. Top reasons to fail, obviously not answering the task. No empathy or rapport. I've seen some of the candidates who are quite robotic. They're not uh, uh, really showing that natural. One of the things I have actually seen working with the local graduates in the hospitals that I work, they come across very natural. Either they're good actors or they're just very comfortable because they have been taught right from the beginning how to interact with the patients. Remember, there is an actor at the end of the day across the screen or if in person you're interacting with, but you still need to make sure that you sound natural. Acting is natural or should be natural, okay? Uh, don't get nervous. I think nervousness will get the... Um, you know, get the better of you. And people often ask me, like, it's easier said than done. I completely agree. Nervousness is natural, especially for the first two scenarios. How to control nervousness? Go slow. Okay. Plus, when you're practicing the scenarios with me, with someone else, do lots and lots of them. All right. Expose yourself to a variety of difficult and variety of situations. So when you go and attend the real scenarios, you can, okay, fine. I've done that. I've got it. Brilliant. Bring it on. All right. We'll do the scenarios. Well, I suggest it's a free session and you should make the most of it. All right. So if you want to do the scenario, anybody, I can, I can, I'm more than happy to take you through it. Okay. It's not question. It's not critiquing. It's just helping you getting through it. So I'll start the first scenario. Um, and who wants to go first? Just let me know, please. Who wants to go first? Any takers? Or shall I just pick? Okay. Dr. Samina, would you like to go through? I've got lots of doctors, Dr. Jackie, and you know, I've seen lots of your emails. You're very enthusiastic. You're very keen. Um, how about you just do a scenario then? Is that all right? Anybody, anybody would go. This is where you understand the term pin drop silence. Oh yes, yes, there is. There is a pin drop silence. I, I think everybody's left. I'm thinking there's something wrong with the Zoom. But I've been there <laughs> and I have been freaked out when somebody has asked me. But it's really just a learning thing. I, I realize yeah, it's that not. I it's not. Want. It's not something that I'm going to critique you on. It's not. I'm going to pass you and fail. It's not like that. And I think if you can do it here, trust me, the exam is going to be piece of cake, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. Who who would like to go? I highly doubt that anyone is going to volunteer. <laughs> Talking from experience myself. All right. Okay. That's Nobody want to volunteer. How are they gonna? Uh, how are they gonna learn? Doctor. Uh, Would you I'll, I'll, yeah. <laughs> Doctor uh, Azmeri, do you want to go through? Just go through, and you know, it's a very easy okay. scenario. I'll help you through. I tell you what, I'll help you. All right. Okay, okay. I'll be hello, on your side. Hello, Doctor Rizwan. Yeah, I, I think I, I like I can try. Yeah. Mm. You've already passed just by volunteering. You've already passed. How's that? Yeah, and that's I'll great. help you with that. Okay, excellent. There you go, Dr. Asmi. That's your scenario. Can you read it out, please, for everyone yeah, to hear? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. So you are working in a GP practice. So your next patient is Mr. Rundle, a 65-year-old patient whom you last saw six weeks ago for symptoms of a UTI. In that consultation, you took blood for a PSA, which came back high. You subsequently referred him to a urologist in a peer exam. The urologist discovered irregular irregularities in the prostate and undertook more investigations. The results showed a prostate carcinoma, Gleason 3 plus 4, 7, and which was not breached the capsule and there were no metastases detected. Mr. Rundle has been told he will have to undergo a radical prostatectomy, but has not understood why and how is now seeing you to ask a few questions he was too scared to ask his urologist. 
Okay, yeah. so the tasks are explain the diagnosis and its consequences, answer Mr. Randall's questions. Okay, you are not required to undertake any physical examination or additional histories. The patient is hemodynamically stable and not in any pain. Easy as anything. Let me tell you one thing, Dr. Azmi, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, you have got amazing communication skills, very clear and very easy to understand. So you're already on a good front foot. All right, Thank now I'll you. give you some time. You can think about it and then we'll work out through error. I, I'm not gonna time you, but we'll just work through that. Just think about it. What are the main things? You can ask me questions. I'll be an actor and uh, we'll go through some things which I've got at the feedback. Okay. You can have, uh, whenever you're ready, just say I'm ready and I'll go through it, okay? It's, okay. it's we, we're both friends now, okay? We're both acting as a group buddy and I'm there to help you. Okay, so I have to just explain the diagnosis and consequences. Yeah. And if there are any question, I have to answer that, right? That's right. Okay. Okay, let me think. You can make notes if you like, if you've got copy and pencil or anything like that. Be my guest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm enjoying okay. your Yeah, but we cannot write down on that two minute when we are waiting. No, no, you right? can't, but I'm just saying yeah. it for the sake of the session right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dr. Croce, can you hear me? It's Shazar. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, Shazar. okay, all right. <laughs> I don't know why I could just sort of raise my hand, but anyway, I tried to kind right. of just click on it on that sort of screen. But that's okay. She's not anyway, to do the next fine. scenario. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to just, just be excellent. in the queue anyway. <laughs> excellent, excellent. You know, something you. is wrong with my Zoom, probably. Uh, I can hear you very Sorry. nice and beautiful oh, Persian accent. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> ah. All right, ready, Dr. Azmi? Yeah, like... Um, That's okay, we'll start and we'll see how it goes. Okay. 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 So, um, hello, I am one of the TP in the practice today. So, what brought you here? Okay, okay. Uh, how may I address you? Uh, my name is uh, Rundle. Uh, you can call me John, if you like. Okay, John. So, what brought you here today? Yes, uh, you may remember that I saw another GP and he did some test and examination and he's got the results back uh, and he asked me to make an appointment. So today I've made an appointment to see you uh, to find out about what the next steps are going to be. What are the results of my, uh, you know, diagnosis? And uh, I think uh, uh, one of the tests called prostate specific antigen came back high. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think... You know, there was a concern that I need to be referred to a urologist. Um, mm -hmm. And I have been to urologist and, uh, you know, there has been a concern that I've got uh, some abnormality there and they have recommended uh, an operation. And I'm a bit concerned about that doctor, Asmeri. Um, and I've got some concerns and questions if uh, I can go through them over with you. Um, that's that's basically uh, what I'm after. I'm, I'm not really sure what all that terminology means, uh, like, and how to how to manage that and address that. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you so much for your concern. So yes, I can uh, see from the notes that your PSA, what th this means, like your poster specific antigen that mm -hmm. became high, and okay. you also had some abnormalities in the parietal examinations. So right. maybe they have uh, uh, like done your like. Um, prostate checkup and yep. they must have find some you know like uh, abnormalities which could you know um, come back to have some like abnormal thing and let me tell mm. you like I, I wish I would wouldn't have to give you this news but it could be a bit like distressing like you could have a carcinoma because oh. 
dear, all right. Oh, um, is it is it spread? Um, like uh, I thought that it's uh, it's not spread. Is it, doctor? Um, um, I, I know. Like I'm I'm really sorry to give you this news. I I cannot even imagine how you are going through this time for mm -hmm. like after hearing this. But uh, let me assure you, you are in safe hands and we can just explore what is going on as I haven't like checked you uh, yet so I can just like do some other investigations and I also um, can refer you to um, one or more um, specialist mm. they will check you and they will do the um, further investigations and mm -hmm. then we could have a better idea of your case but Dr. Asmi, uh, the you. urologist that I saw, he has recommended an operation, uh, something called mm -hmm. radical prostatectomy, and he, yeah. he, yeah, and I wasn't just sure if that's the best thing because look, I'm I'm quite well actually, I've got no symptoms, and mm -hmm. I was reading online and checking that it can cause some impotence, it can cause incontinence, uh, and. And I'm, I'm actually quite concerned about that. Like if I was to have an operation for this cancer, these side effects could be lifelong for me. They could be very uh, distressing and may invoke some lifestyle changes for me, right? Um, yeah, no, uh, you are, uh, yeah, it's good that you are concerned, but let me assure you, there are like thousands of patients who are having these conditions who are going undergoing radical prostatectomy. And there are some other procedures, like the, there are some other hormonal, uh, you know, like um, we can give the hormones which is needed afterwards. So mm -hmm. you will not have such sort of a problem. We can handle all the things after the operation. And it doesn't mean after this operation, you are going to be um, like uh, infertile. It's not like that. You can still have babies, but mm -hmm. the thing is like um, for this carcinoma, you have to just like, you know, get rid of it. And that's why this is the best option for you now. And mm. um, I will also give you some reading materials mm -hmm. and I will refer you to, to one of the other specialists to mm -hmm. make sure that you are like, uh, what else you are just having. And I, I will also check all the other um, um uh, other things which are necessary for your case and i will review uh, you in like one week time is that all right that sounds like a plan doctor and do you think that i need to have this operation right is it really important for me i think yes all for right. me you have to go through it and okay. let's see we'll stop here other... <laughs> we'll stop here excellent thank you very much dr asviri and the reason i've stopped you is because in the interest of Ram, you got a lot of ground to cover. I thought we'll start the feedback. First of all, as I said, your communication skills are very good. It's very easy to understand. And uh, you've got a nice pace and rhythm to it. Uh, this scenario is very specific in terms of a new diagnosis of prostatic carcinoma. Don't worry about this classification disorder in terms of uh, um, whatever the classification of colorectal cancer or prostate cancer or lung staging cancer is. They will always tell you in the scenario what it means which it says here, it has not breached the capsule and there are no metastases. So it's a moderately differentiated cancer, all right? So make sure that you pay a little bit of an attention to it. It's a localized cancer, but oh, moderately yeah. differentiated, all right? <laughs> I was more of the, like, yeah, it was like totally the new one for me. I only knew the theory thing from the first part, but yeah. I had no idea how to just like, like, you know, like, uh, explain the diagnosis and all that so but I just tried to you know uh, no, no, that's, okay. that's all right yeah. now in terms of the uh, task the question was explaining the diagnosis so that's where it comes in that look I'm so it's a slight breaking the bad news so I would start look uh, my name is Dr. Rizwan Qureshi thank you for coming in uh, Mr. Randall and I believe that uh, you've come in after having a consultation with a urologist and you've got some questions for me how about we go through your questions and address some of the concerns? We'll tell, uh, we'll then plan mutually what the next plan would be, and I'll answer any questions that you may have after this information. So that lays out a framework that I'm going to tell you something, you're going to ask me something, and then we're going to plan the next step. Right? Make sense? Yeah. Good, good. So diagnosis, you can say, that, look, unfortunately, 
Um, and, and before giving every bad news, you would need to go through the components, make sure that the patient is not alone, he's well supported. Um, has he got anyone who needs to be during this consultation? Always mention that even though Mr. Randall, you're here by yourself, do you want me to, uh, do you would like to have your partner or your wife here at this time? And they may say, no, doctor, it's quite okay. Um, just mention it. And that's a part of the rapport building, okay? Moving on. Look, I'm sorry to say you that uh, we had the biopsy and as the urologist told you, it showed a cancer. And you can use that word, okay? You need to be very directive. You need to make sure that you click in that uh, diagnosis and you make sure that the patient understand that. And it's a cancer which is even though localized to the prostate and it's not spread to the rest of your body, but it does need treatment for it not to do that. And then stop. Then start again. Are you okay? Have you, are you feeling all right? And you say, yeah, yeah, doctor, it was quite a shock, but I didn't imagine that, whatever it was. And then I'll start again. Okay, so what are my options? My question would be, okay, so your option says that as a urologist said that it is a cancer which could potentially spread. It could even be life-threatening. So we need to have an operation to deal with this kind of scenario. Now, an operation that is normally done is called radical prostatectomy. All right. And you can explain something. If you know about radical prostatectomy, you can and tell that, look, this is the procedure which involves removing a prostate and some of the surrounding tissue. But your urologist would be able to give you a bit more detail about how it's done. And then my verbal cue would be, OK, doctor, it sounds like quite a big operation. What do you think uh, might be some of the side effects? So two of the most common side effects are impotence and incontinence. Even though I mentioned that because I thought it was slightly, by the way, this was a scenario which was in the last exam, I think, or exam before last, uh, this year at least. So this is, a, this is what I'm focused on as an actor. That, okay, fine. I could get impotent. I could have uh, an issues with incontinence. So you need to address both these issues. In, important means that I might not be able to get, uh, you know, uh, erection. I might not be able to have, you know, the lifestyle changes from that point of view. And from that point of view, there are a number of different remedies available, which is a combination of both mechanical devices, some, um, you know, some medications, and that would need a further consultation to go through them when it comes to that. All right, but that's the minimum requirement of explaining what the impotence is and how can it be addressed. That's the critical error tick. Okay, the other thing in terms of incontinence, you can say that, look, it's a rare complication, but it, if it does happen, there are different ways of addressing that as well. All right, and I can tell you there's some incontinence pad, there's some devices and remedies, there are some other timing devices, self catheterization, whatever it is, and then we can go through that information as well. But I think you need to address these concerns as a very legitimate concerns and offer him treatment or offer him an information which involves the treatment from both these complications. All right. Um, the other thing is that you did one thing very good is that you said that, look, what you need to do is I'll give you an information about this operation, including the complication, including it straight, how does it happen? And then I'll get you back and we'll talk about it a bit further. So every management should be there with the foresight of repeated um, you know, consultations. So that was done very good. And I'll provide you with the reading material, we'll provide you with the support. And if there's any question that you go home and you've got anything else, then you can come back to me. So remember that um, a squid thing that we're talking about summary in terms of what is the, uh, what is the problem? You summarize all that, you've got a prostate cancer, what's the treatment? radical prostatectomy, two side effects, incontinence and uh, impotence, treatment strategies, further consultations, any questions come back to me. So this is the critical errors that I've got in list in front of me. Tell the patients a low grade, you know, tell the patients a moderate, moderately differentiated, moderate grade cancer. It's not a low grade cancer. It does need operation. Operation can cause these two complications and we're gonna address these complications subsequently in further consultation. Has anybody got anything to say in this regard if you've got if i've got a urologist in this group then please tell me and i'll i'll hold my peace dr asmiri do you have anything to say or dr omara have you got anything to add no it's really a good that we could have the clear idea because mm. I was confused with this part, like it has not breached, but it, it is also not metastasized. So yeah, it should get the operation, but uh, it needs the operation, but I was not sure. 
So that's why that's I okay. didn't go in that part. That's okay. All right, we'll start the scenario two. Uh, she's our, um, I think he wanted to do the scenario. You ready, my friend? Well, I'm happy to, yep. Excellent. Let's go through that. So would you like to read, please? Yes. You're working in ED. Your next question is Ruth, a 72-year-old lady who has, uh, who has background of COPD. She came in with increased SOB, um, shortness of breath. Uh, she is COVID negative. Her saturations are 92% RA and blood pressure and heart rate are adequate tasks. Take a focused, uh, focused test history. Explain the physical examination respiratory to a med doctor. You are not required to provide treatment nor make disposition decisions. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, I'll give you a minute or two to gather yourself and thoughts. Sure. Uh, you're more than welcome to make notes if you like. It's just a practice run. I'll be there to help you just as, as I did Dr. Asmiri, okay? Thank you. So remember one thing, Shizar, she, she, that you're interacting with a medical student. My name is Rizwan. I'm the final year medical student. And you're basically explaining to me how would you examine a patient with COPD, just to clarify. Okay. <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so just on that, um, before we proceed. First, you can so, take a focus history from me. Yeah, which is a patient, and then I'll become uh, a medical yeah. student, and you can explain the examination finding, like how to examine the patient of COPD. Okay. All right, we start? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dr. Shiza Nahidi. I'm one of the um, emergency physicians working in this facility. Uh, can I have your name and your age, please? Yeah, my name is Ruth. Uh, I'm 72. Uh, and doctor, I've, as you can see, I'm quite short breath, yes. Yeah, I can see. Well for a few days now. Yeah, I can see. Are you in pain uh, by any chance? No, I've got no pain. Uh, is there anything I can do for you straight away now? Uh, no, I've just uh, had some uh, uh, some of my puffers, so I'm feeling yeah. that I'm relaxing out a little bit. Yeah. Do you think you're in a capacity to, with, that we can uh, go ahead? Yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks for your doctor. And if you don't mind, if I ask you a few, a few questions with relation to the uh, to the conditions that you have, and it's called COPD, if you're if you've heard about that. Yes, I'm happy to go through that. Thank you. Okay. So um, do you mind if I ask you about your background? Tell me about uh, the COPD and the diagnosis, where that was uh, made and how long have you been struggling with this, with this condition? Yeah, so um, I have had uh, emphysema for about more than 10 years now. I have been a lifelong smoker. Um, I started smoking when I was pretty much 14. That was the trend at those times. Uh, I smoked pack a day, uh, pretty much from 25 age onwards. But I've packed up smoking about five years ago. But I guess the damage was already done. I was diagnosed with emphysema 10 years ago. Um, and yes, uh, it is it is something which I am made to live up with. I do respiratory follow-up with one of the respiratory specialists. Um, but in the last one week, doctor, I've just been very short of breath. Normally, I'm able to control my symptoms with my puffers. But in the last yeah. one week, it's been very very bad. And I think my GP was initially concerned whether I could have COVID and he did the test, which came back negative, as you know. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just so short of breath, uh, just un unable to sort of walk even up to the toilet. I cannot climb stairs. I cannot do anything which I can normally do otherwise, even with this disease. How long, since when you noticed that kind of like situation coming in the stage that we can 
you can't actively and no ordinarily do your 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 daily activities yeah so i developed some uh, cough uh, about four days ago it became more yep. and more productive um, yep. um, in the last uh, two days um, so i'd say about four days and two days with more productive cough and more shortness of breath. And today, as I said, that even doing a slight amount of work is just making me completely out of breath. Do you feel dizzy? Uh, no, I haven't got any dizziness, just just feeling, um, you know, short of breath and uh, very tight in my chest, which I, yeah. I've been using my inhalers. I've used it like six times since morning. It gives me a very slight relief mm -hmm. and then I'll back, be back to square one. And can you tell me about your coughs? Yeah, has there been any change to the, uh, to the nature of the cough, like the consistency, any color stains in, in your cough recently? Yeah, so it was initially quite white, uh, mucusy. Yep. Um, it has uh, become a little bit yellow uh, and brown in the last 24 hours. Yep. Uh, but that, that is my normal uh, sort of thing. It does tend to change like that. Any temperature did you, that you might not have noticed uh, recently? I felt hot, but I, you know, I felt hot, but I haven't measured myself to have a temperature. Right, right. Anything else in particular that you might think that might be related to the to the condition, to COPD, to emphysema? Oh, look, I'm an, I'm on home oxygen. I forgot to mention yeah. that. So I am on home oxygen. I am on one liter via constant liter, and even that, it's not helping me out. Normally, uh, when I'm short of breath, more short of breath, I take my inhalers, put myself on oxygen, I'm able to get relief. But now even that's not helping me out. Okay, I understand it. And tell me about, about your, your your medications, your tests you're, you're using. You said you have been uh, using the puffers, like sprays. Do you remember yeah. the name of that puffer? Yeah, so I'm on Ventolin, uh, two puffs yep. uh, whenever I need it. Uh, I'm also on Ceratide, uh, two yep. puffs twice daily. I'm also on yep. Spireva. Uh, and my GP has put me on some steroid prednisones. Um, I've been taking them for about a day, 25 milligrams daily. And uh, I, I take, yeah, yeah. And I take uh, Remipril for high blood pressure, um, uh, five milligrams. Yeah, that's that's all my medications. Okay, and uh, Bunch, do you, uh, do you, uh, you, you're not smoking at this point in time, like you're not smoking, right? No. A any alcohol? No alcohol. You, do, you don't drink? Okay. And any allergies? I haven't got any allergies, doctor. Right, thank you. Uh, do you have any family history in your background? Like, do you have any members of the family having that, you know, suffering from COPD, emphysema, or bronchitis? Oh, look, I mean, all our family were smokers, so they have had I some see. sort of complication from that bronchitis and emphysema. It's not a family, but it's just because of the smoking, I guess. And can I ask if you have your vaccinations? Do you have like four vaccinations? Yeah, I've had, I've had vaccinations, flu, yeah. Flu yeah. shot? You've got yeah, flu I've shot. had flu shot this year as well, yeah, since. And winter. you've been on, uh, you've been with your GP. Can I ask if you your GP has put you on your care plan, like advanced care plan or any care plan for the COPD, right. home care, or any particular matters for management of the chronic conditions back home? I have got a management plan, which I tend to follow, but, uh, yeah. you know, as I said, the management plan involves me taking the bronchodilator and, uh, you know, uh, steroids, but it's not been helping me out. That's why I've come in here. And if I can touch, with, touch back uh, on the, 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 the main problem, it's just the shortness of breath that you're suffering now. Is that, is that and, my understanding? And quite a lot of wheeze and cough, yes. And wheeze and cough. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for the information. If you don't okay, mind, you've got about two minutes to explain the physical examination to the medical. If you don't mind, <laughs> not a good time management. Um, um, uh, if you don't mind, I'll be uh, just uh, briefing my uh, colleague, uh, who's a doctor here, Dr. Rizwan. Uh, he's uh, my uh, colleague intern, uh, medical student um, here. Um, Dr. Rizwan, um, uh, we have uh, Ruth, a 72-year-old lady. He, she's been suffering. A, for, from emphysema for more than 10 years. Um, and uh, she has been on medication. If you, uh, we will, and we now, we're now going to uh, do some physical examination uh, for this patient. Um, we have to introduce ourselves to the patient. Uh, so uh, I introduce you to the patient, to Ruth, and we'll be asking uh, Ruth if she's happy for us to go through some physical examination. Ruth, is that all right for you? That's okay with me. You can okay, talk to right. student, yes. All right. So uh, now we are going to have the consent from the patient. Uh, okay. And uh, just to make sure if she is happy for us to 
Do you specifically examine yeah. yeah. uh, The examination would be um, basically to two, in two components. The first component is a general examination of the of the respiratory system, mainly with a focus. Uh, then we've got some other ex additional uh, respiratory examinations, uh, as we call them, uh, the um, the. Uh, that, and they will be involving some tools, some equipment um, to do the respirometry respir uh, okay. in, uh, in our room. Uh, the, the examination for the, for the respiratory system would involve that we inspect the patient. We need to uh, inspect the patient in terms of how and whether the patient's using from the accessory muscles, uh, general appearance of the patient, um, if the patient is stable, hemodynamically stable, or is, uh, she's showing the signs of deterioration, that we have to mm -hmm. act and stop the examination. But there's yeah. a general examination, malaise, fatigue, will, there will be uh, manifested from the general appearance. Uh, then we'll be focusing on uh, the uh, other signs of, or other signs and symptoms of the uh, COPD in other organs of the body, mainly the hands, uh, then the cyanosis, central cyanosis, and other um, organ and uh, impacts on other organs. They say, like, if the patient's been clubbing, or uh, whether the capillary filling has been impact, impact, or uh, whether there are other impacts on the chest and heart, heart uh, like cardio, cardiovascular system. That's the observation. Then we are going to listen to the sounds of the heart, listen to the sounds of the um, respiratory system. Uh, we are going to have some. Uh, Percussions on the chest wall to see if there is like super, super, uh, lots of percussions have been changed dramatically recently, and then um, then uh, the touching the uh, chest wall to see the activity of the accessory muscles and any deformities in the chest wall. And uh, these would be incorporating our physical examination for a respiratory system. In terms of using the respirator and respiratory meter. We have to um, advise the patient and educate the patient in terms of how we use that. This is our respirometer. I'm not sure if you've got <laughs> like, a, like a respirator in, in our room, though, just up in a, in a comment box. But um, we have to ask the patient to take a deep breath and then, mm -hmm. then uh, forcefully use uh, all the muscles to, to breathe in uh, into this respirator and, and how would to... that help doctor like what what's the purpose of that the purpose of this is just to differentiate and actually identify if the uh, conditions that the patient is suffering from is true due to restrictive uh, diseases with the pulmonary system or due to obstructive or is a mix mix mixture of both and mm -hmm. that would be an outcome of using doing this respiratory test so Any other use for that uh, spirometry? Like, I mean, obviously we know that she's got obstructive pulmonary disease already. Yeah. Anything but, else that we can utilize this for? Uh, um, I think uh, what the, the main thing is uh, to identify if the patient's deteriorating or not. Or, yep, yep. Um, All right, so severity, uh, mark the severity of... The yeah. severity of, yeah, the, the, um, the COPD. And that okay. will be based on the measurement of FEV1 and the FEVC. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in detail. Okay. So how about we stop here now? Thank you very much. Sure. I think that, oh, was, uh, that was, I must say, how does <laughs> it feel? It feels quite overwhelming, right? It was, it was pretty pressed. I was yeah, uh, quite. Yeah. Look, I think <laughs> you won't get that much of, uh, I mean, obviously it's a focused history, which always is open to how much should you ask and how little should you leave. Yeah. But then again, for the purpose of exam, you have to just quickly go through. And that's the purpose of the course. We're not mm -hmm. telling you something new. You've obviously got a lot of information. It's not organized, it's just coming on randomly. So look, in terms of the component number one, taking the focus history, you start off clearly introducing yourself. So that's the framework number one. My name is Dr. Shiraz or Shizar, and I'm here to ask you a few questions, plan some investigation, and then I'll be explaining the physical examination to a medical student. Is that okay with you? So you've done and dealt with the component part of the consent early on. Mm -hmm. All right. Then in terms of the history, start off with the present illness. Tell me what has, I always, in even my practical life, I always start with an open-ended question tell me what brings you to the practice give them five ten minutes they're an actor 
squeeze the juice out of those actors, let them volunteer all the positive information which you can use for the rest of the time. Tell me, okay, 10, 20, 30 seconds, let them speak. I've been unwell, had some shortness of breath, developed some cough, got more productive, might have some fevers, the cough colors changed, I'm, I'm on home oxygen, it's not getting better. All right, now you've got an idea and now you can fill in those questions and go and get more detail about it. So in that way, you're more economical with your time. Mm -hmm. go through the past medical history. Now, one thing which is very, very important and which you did touch briefly is, have you ever had an, any ICU admission? Have you ever had any prolonged hospital admissions? Um, so that will go and showing the reflection that this COPD patient can be quite bad, really. Um, I have to you know, rush uh, her care into the hospital. So we always tend to ask any critical care admission any previous invasive ventilation in ICU or non-invasive ventilation in ICU or in ICU or respiratory ward, like a BiPAP or um, CPAP, because that in current climate is very important. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and then after past medical history, any other medical issues, any pneumonias, any particular antibiotics that you've taken, any allergies which you've asked, social history, are you still smoking? Is there anybody in your home who's still smoking, all right? And any other contact tracing from that point, if you have been well, but normally this starts with the upper risk tract infection, has anybody else been unwell? Um, good, moving on very swiftly. Whenever you're talking to the medical student, there's a set of questions. Look, my name is Dr. Shizar. I'm going to take you through the physical examination, which is respiratory physical examination. Um, and it will incorporate how to lay out a plan. What I mm -hmm. want to teach you is how to assess the patient from the respiratory point of view, okay? How to mark the severity of COPD. Is it a mild exacerbation? Is it a moderate exacerbation? Or, so you've laid out the framework. This is what we're going to do today. Okay, so take the consent, wash your hats, don the PPE. So in current climate, we must say that, right? Mm. So because you're taking a history and examination for patient, whenever you're approaching a patient with respiratory tract symptoms, make sure you see them in an isolated area with a proper personal protective equipment, eye shield, mask, which is N95, gown, and gloves, all right? We start off with the hands of the patient in terms of checking for peripheral cyanosis, clubbing, which might be an indicator for long-term chronic obstructive or bronchogenic carcinoma. Moving up, we check for the pulse. If it's tachycardic, it might be a reflection of underlying infection, pneumonia, or distress. We'll then check, moving up, we'll check for the axillary lymph nodes, the clavicular lymph node. There could be an underlying cancer, which might be spreading. And then we'll check for the JVP because cardiovascular and respiratory examination very mm interlaced. Yeah. And when you come to the respiratory examination, my target here is to inspect, palpate, percuss, and auscultate. And go through, starting with the trachea midline, make sure it's not pulled or pushed on either side. Listening, to, okay. And then inspecting the chest in terms of uh, breathing is expanding symmetrically, or one side is less expanding. There could be underlying emphysema bulla, which is ruptured, giving her a pneumothorax. If there's reduced air entry from that point of view, percussing, Okay, and auscultating, checking for bees and the quality of breaths of sounds across all the respiratory zone, front and back and under the axilla and stop. Okay, and just keep on mentioning when you're doing the teaching scenarios that, look, I know there's a lot of information. We'll cover as much ground as we can. But if there's any other question, how about we make time for some future sessions so we can go through that in a later time? Because you're teaching, the examiner is not judging you in physical examination. Well, he is but he's also judging your teaching, which is your job when you come and work as a doctor on the floor. Does it make sense? And then you say that in order to complete the respiratory system examination, I would like to do a spirometry and an ECG of the patient, because as I said, you know, these are the bedside mm -hmm. tests, which would be an indicative underlying cardiovascular complication. She might be in a heart failure and mother differential could be on heart failure or an exacerbation of COPD uh, in terms of your bronchodilator treatment. So if you give them a pre-spirometry, you know, pre and post, so you yeah. give them a pre ventilin spirometry and post ventilin run with good reversibility that demonstrate the patient is showing improvement. All right. So this is, this is just a very frame. At the end, you explain to the patient, look, your symptoms are concerning. You're not getting, I need to, I need to, you know, admit you, but admit this you is all. scenario is not to provide treatment. So you don't have to interact with the patient. But to the medical student, you can say, have you got any questions for me? Okay, I hope it clarifies some of the basic concepts of respiratory examination. Yeah. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to be approached again. Anything else, Dr. Omara or Dr. Fatma or Dr. Saman, do you need to add on or any of the participants who need to add on? Uh, sir, I would like to add here. 
Yeah. Go for it. When they say that you have to take a focused history, it means that you only have two minutes for that. And the remaining mm -hmm. six minutes are for physical examination. Okay. So in okay. two minutes, you can only ask like five to six questions. To be very oriented, what you, why you are asking whatever you are asking. What is the rationale behind it? Or what is your differential for which you are asking that question? So Perfect. I, I had told that the first question should be always to delineate the extent of the problem with which the patient has presented. Yeah. This patient has presented with shortness of breath. So you have to exactly measure like how severe is that shortness of breath. And mm -hmm. feel, so MRC dyspnea scale, you will simply ask, are you able to do your normal household course or not? So if mm -hmm. he's not able to even manage his own household course, which he previously used to do, it means that he is stage four. You have already mm -hmm. been delineated the extent of the problem. Mm -hmm. Now you have to ask some question about the cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. Whether this shortness of breath is of respiratory origin, mm -hmm. or it is of uh, cardiovascular origin. Yep. You're not thinking about uh, trauma here or connective tissue disorders here because of the age. So those are out of question. Our main is respiratory origin or cardiovascular. So yep. for, you will ask about if the patient has any edema or if the patient has orthopnea, etc. Mm -hmm. If the patient has any other history, the patient has any diabetes, he might be having a silent MI right, right now. So these are the questions to be kept in mind. And after that, just move on to the physical examination. You can also ask, ask about the travel, etc. Mm -hmm. If the patient has been to any other location, there can be some pneumonias, etc. So Perfect. that so let me summarize. So basically, what Dr. Saman is saying, and that's a very good point. Thank you, Dr. Saman, is to mark the severity of COPT exacerbation and just quickly work out the differential. Is it an exacerbation of CCF? Could it be an underlying PE? And then quickly move on to the physical examination because you want to pass the station and the physical examination has got quite a lot of ground to cover. All right, that's good. Excellent. So I'll get Thank Dr. You. Fatma Siddiqui to do the exam scenario number three with any participant who would like to do that next one. I think we've had a couple of takers who would like to go. Yes. So Hiba and Romana, we're happy to do some cases. Okay, I might just ask Dr. Hiba to start if like, Hi, Dr. Hi, everybody. All right, Dr. Hiba, you're on. Yep. Go for it. You are working in a GP practice. Your next patient, Maria, 55 years old, is well known to the practice, but sees you for the first time. She has come today to inquire about hormone replacement therapy as she is going through menopause. She wants to know the pros and cons as well as the different options. Task, take a brief focus history. Counsel Maria in regard to HRT options. This station involved no physical examination. Sure. All right. And Dr. Fatma would be your uh, um, interactive tutor here now. Fatma, oh, over okay. to you. Okay, Hiba, you've got your reading yep. time now? Yep. I'm happy to start. You're happy to start the case? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Hi, doctor. Hi, Maria. I'm Hiba, one of the doctor here. Uh, how can I help you today? Um, doctor, I haven't seen you before. I've seen some of the other uh, doctors at this practice. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about menopause. I've been having some trouble and, you know, some of my friends mentioned about hormone replacement therapy. So I just wanted to see, you know, talk to you about that. Yeah, sure. Um, um, I really appreciate your visit. Uh, I understand that this is the sensitive uh, condition uh, we are talking about. So let me reassure you that everything could be confidential between me and you unless it's harming you or anybody else. So I'm happy to help you now. Would you mind to tell me um, what question you want me to answer? And I'm happy to help you with. I believe that, uh, as you said, uh, you are going through menopause. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you mind me to would you mind to tell me more about it? Sure. So um, I'm having a lot of hot flushes and night sweats. I just can't sleep at night because of them and it's just it's just really, really affecting my life. I understand how it is difficult you are passing it through. Don't worry, I'm here to help you. So uh, since how long you have this hot flushes? It's been about a year now, a year or two oh. years. Okay, and is it is it start suddenly or gradually? 
Um, it started a bit slowly, but I was just, uh, and it's been getting worse, but I really didn't get time to come and see the doctor. Oh, okay, understand that. And uh, how does it affect your life? Well, you know, the hot flushes, they're just absolutely really, you know, they're really bad. Um, and the night sweats, I, I keep waking up at night, I can't sleep. So it, it really affects my whole day the next day. I'm tired. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry for that. And mm -hmm. would you mind to tell me when you start, uh, when you stopped your period? Um, when I was about 52. Okay, so three years from now. Yeah. And um, uh, do you have any bleeding after that? Or uh, any spotting? No, no period since then. Great. And do you have any problem with your pee? With No, urine is fine. Okay. And do you have any issue? Uh, do you feel any lump of, uh, from down below? Lumps, no, no lumps in that area. That's good. And what about your sexual activity? Are you still sexually active? Um, I try to, but you know, the vaginal dryness, it's really, it's affecting me as well. So you're not that act as active anymore. Mm. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, would you mind to tell me how many kids you have? So I've got two children. They're all grown up. They, yeah. Okay. And they are normal delivery or cesarean? No, normal vaginal deliveries. Okay. And uh, what about any uh, contraception you used before? No. Okay. Yes, what, yeah. about, uh, okay. Uh, what about any um, uh, uh, cervical screening test was done for you before? Yeah, I had one uh, uh, a year ago that was normal. They said next one will be in four years, five years. Sweet. Sweet. Mm. And what about um, a stable partner? Yeah, I'm married. Uh, we've been married oh, okay. for 40 years now. Yeah. Great, great, mm -hmm. good. And what about um, any sexual transmitted disease? Screening was done for you or your husband? Yeah, um, we have been, no, we have no other partners, so we haven't really tested for a long time. Good, good. Okay. And uh, do you have any history of headache or migraine? No. Okay. Any high blood pressure? Yeah, I've got high blood pressure. And is it controlled? I'm on some medications. Yeah, it's, it's uh, controlled. Okay. And did you see anybody for the hypertension? Yeah, but just my the GPs that I come here for, they give me some medications. I'm not sure what medications I'm on. There's just a oh, lot of medications okay. I'm on. Oh, okay. Got you. And you are measuring your blood pressure at home? Yeah, when I come here, they say it's normal. Great. And mm. what about uh, any uh, history of uh, breast cancer or breast tumor or family history of breast cancer? Yeah, I had breast cancer. I was diagnosed about three years ago. Mm. Okay, yeah. what you are doing for the breast cancer? Yeah, so they did chemo and radiation, and I see my specialist every year or so. Okay, and it, it is going anywhere else? No, they said it was localized. Okay, that's good news. And what about any uh, clot? Do you have any history of a clot or family history of clotting? No. Oh, okay, okay, good. Uh, and what about any surgery before? Uh, no. Any, oh, yes, uh, I had one surgery. Um, I had some stents put in my heart. Mm, that was oh. about five years ago. Okay, and are they giving you any aspirin or anything for it? Yeah, I'm on some medications. I don't know. I'm on some pills. You'll have one oh. on the record. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got you, got you. And you are along with the cardiologist for it? Yes. Any history of chest pain or anything? No, any not since the stents. Not since That's then. A great. Mm. That's a great. Uh, any smoking, drinking, any drug recreation, drug? Uh, no, I don't smoke. I hardly ever drink alcohol and I don't take any other drugs. Oh, okay. And what is uh, uh, occup your occupation? Um, I used to work in the bank. I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, living my life now. Oh, okay, great. And what about um, your husband? Is he supportive? Do you have yes, he's very, yeah. Yes, he's fine. Yeah, that's great. Uh, did you try any method for hot flushes? Did you um, use the air condition or anything to help you with? No, this is the first time I'm coming to someone about these things. Oh, oh okay. I ju just wanted to talk about hormone replacement therapy. Look, okay, sure. can, I, can I have uh, that? 
Sure. So I understand how it is difficult you are passing it through. Um, uh, I took the history. Your history um, is showing that you have some high blood pressure. You have some uh, issue with the breast cancer. You have some issue with um, uh, your heart. So what is the hormone replacement therapy? So when, when we have the menopause, your ovary is stop working. So stop secreting the estrogen and the progesterone, which affect your uh, system and make you have hot flushes. Um, one of the contraindications, what I mean by contraindication, the things that stop us from giving a hormone replacement is if you have any breast cancer or family history of a breast cancer, if you have any heart issue, if you have uh, any hypertension, okay. unfortunately, these are the contraindication. What, what does that mean? That we have something called benefit and risk. So we mm -hmm. need to weigh the benefit that you have and uh, mm -hmm. compare it to the risk. So the risk that you have, if you are taking the contraception, the uh, HRT, the hormone replacement, mm -hmm. is more than the benefit. <laughs> so what other options do I have then? So what is the option that you have? Uh, we can do lifestyle modification, which is the most important thing. So what I can mean? teach you what does that mean? That we can change our life by, let's say, if you feel that you are hot, you can uh, open the air condition. Mm. You can going out uh, you can uh, do uh, some um, uh, stick to the healthy lifestyle, uh, stick to uh, physical exercise, uh, doing some um, yoga and meditation relaxation. It could help with these things. As I told you, um, the air condition is very good. Take a shower, which is uh, the uh, cold shower, which will really help with the hot flashes. And let's see after that, after a couple of weeks, how you are doing so far if you are happy with it we can continue if you are not happy with it i can refer you to the what else can i do so if i can't have uh, the hormone therapy is there anything else i can have i'm happy to do all these lifestyle changes anything else uh, so let's start with the lifestyle modification and let's mm -hmm. uh, do also the all the investigation that is required um i forgot to ask you about um any uh storm uh, that the bowel uh, endoscopy was done for you according to the program no so i have my bowel test every two years and that's been fine that's great and any history of fall recurrent fall because of bone issue no otherwise i've been okay that's good so uh, at the moment we can do the a lot of investigation to be sure that everything is going okay we mm. can start with lifestyle modification as we said uh, we can check also the thyroid uh, to be sure that it is not related to thyroid that cause weather change or any other problem mm. and then we can start from that if you are not happy with this lifestyle modification i can refer you to the uh, gynecologist they can talk to you more about it um, and I will give you reading material and we can see you in a couple of weeks as we All right, start. we'll stop here. I think that's a good summary. And I'll got Dr. Fatma to mm. feedback. I think just because of the interest of time, we've got quite a lot of ground to cover. But mm. Dr. Fatma has got a special interest in HRT being a GP. So she would be able to tell you some practical as well as exam insights. Go on, Fatma. Oh, okay. Thank you so, very much for that, Dr. Hiba. It was, it was good. Thank you. Thank you, Hiba. So I think that was really, really good. Um, especially your, the way you started and the way you introduced yourself and you were very empathetic, knowing that this is a women's case and women feel very sensitive about, especially when she said, I haven't talked about this with anyone else before. So that means she's quite, um, you know, it, uh, they feel a bit embarrassed about it as well. Um, so I think your communication in that regard was just, just really, really good. Um, you started off with uh, the confid uh, confidentiality and empathy. Excellent. Then because it had to be a focused history, so you focused on the menopause, which was great. Um, you did ask about when it started and, you know, what symptoms was she having? Um, that was really good. One thing that I would add would be to ask your, uh, ask some questions that you think that uh, some symptoms of menopause can be. So she might be thinking the vaginal dryness is not related to this. She might not know that her recurrent UTIs or um, her tiredness, like I had to say that myself. So um, just ask all of those symptoms of menopause that you can think of at that moment, because it can cause depression and mood swings and irritability. And as soon as you say, are you feeling irritable? And they, they're really excited. Yes, yes, doctor, I'm feeling irritable. And then it helps them understand that those symptoms are all uh, connected with the menopause. 
and of course we think about depression and mental health issues as well but it really it really helps the patient um it was really good that you ask about vaginal bleeding so um and then you ask about, I was waiting for you to ask about the uh, mammograms and CST. And that is where you caught that she has a history of breast cancer because the patients are not going to tell you themselves um, unless, because they don't know that it's important and they think everything is on the record. We don't have to mention it at all. Mm -hmm. So that was really good. Um, you ask, so you basically covered all the preventative health and bowel screening and those sort of things. You asked about SNAP, smoking, nutrition, alcohol, physical activity. Um, always, always ask them because there's something that you can always catch from those things as well. Um, then you explained about um, what contraindication means. So that's what I'm saying. That's why your um, communication was very good with the patient. Um, this case is as much as it is about your knowledge about HRD, it is also about, it is a lot about patient education and um, reassurance and um, saying that, you know, we can treat it, we'll, you know, you can come back, those sort of things. Um, just a little, uh, just a little take home message with lifestyle uh, modifications. That was excellent because she can't have HRT. There's no way she can have HRT. But you can also talk about non-hormonal treatments so she can have, um, for vaginal dryness, she can use lubricants, not the estrogen ones, just simple lubricants. And she can use um, their antidepressants like SSRIs, SNRIs, um, clonidine, gabapentin. So these are non non three non-hormonal uh, options. And the third thing that I would mention is um, just some patient education. So if you know about the Jean Hales website, J-E-A-N-H-A-I-L-E-S, it, it has information for health professionals as well. It has fact sheets for all sort of women conditions. I just, I would just say, you know, write down the name for them on a piece of paper and say, look, this is some, this is a website. Why don't you read some bits about menopause? Come back in a week after you've done the lifestyle changes and we'll see you then. Even though you didn't mention the non-hormonal options, I think the way that you went about this case and the fact that you asked her to come back because I uh, was in a similar um, scenario when, when I sat my AMC exam and there was a question where I didn't know specifically how to answer one that little bit. I gave them some information, asked them to come back and you know I, I passed that case. But that also, it, it's also because you did really well in the top bit. So, um, so she has two contraindications which you caught, and that was basically the critical error in not catching that. So, I think that was really good. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. I Thank think I've you. I've learned a lot listening to both of you, <laughs> and I think this is uh, Dr. Fatma is uh, going to be doing quite a few sessions with our core AMC uh, course and the evening course, and I'm sure that she's got wealth of experience across the general practice, and she can share also those practical tips which come in very handy when you're doing an exam which is all practically oriented. So thank you very much, Dr. Fatma. One question I would like to ask in addition is. What do you think about the communication surrounding that? Like, I mean, obviously it was quite obvious that Dr. Heba was pressed for time. How can you move in quickly to all those vital necessary question in a short span of time from the exam point of view? I think once you have built the rapport in the beginning, that's done. You've done the rapport building time for the exam. The examiner doesn't necessarily need to listen to it continuously. Do you mind if I ask you? Can I please ask you? Mm. This is time to take history. So I think once you've built the rapport, so hi, uh, my name is Dr. Fatna. What brings you in today? Oh, you're having hot flashes. That sounds terrible. So can you tell me what symptoms are you having? Just dive right into it. Mm. Um, I just wanted to ask you a few questions about this, and then we'll get back to the treatment options. And then always asking, do you understand what I mean? So do you understand what menopause is? It means when you haven't had periods for over 12 months. Because it and is a patient education. Yes, exactly. So just NGS. getting back to the patient and just ask a couple of times in the middle, it, um, and please don't use any medical jargon. Medical jargon, if you used uh, any words that are medical terms, that's, you're gone. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. So simple words, keep asking them, do you understand? Thank you so much for coming today. Look, uh, I just want to say these are the options. Why don't you come back in a week? And just the way the tone of your voice and the way you're not interrupting them, you're letting them speak, giving them time to speak. That's it. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Fatma. That was excellent. I really thoroughly enjoyed. Anybody got any questions to Dr. Fatma? You can ask them now. 
Um, otherwise, I'll just move on to the next exam scenario. We just got a few more cases to cover and then we'll conclude the session, not long. All right, who's gonna do the next scenario? Any takers on that? Dr. Romana, would you like to go through? Yes. All right, okay, I can't hear you too well. Can you hear me clearly? Uh, hello? I, I can hear you now, perfect. Okay, there you go, Dr. Romana, start. Uh, I was not in the study for a couple of months. That's so I can okay. try, I don't know. Absolutely, this is all, it's a friendly match, right? <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, go for it. Thank you. Can you read it out loud, Dr. Romana, so everybody right. can hear? Yeah. Yes. You are seeing uh, Barbara, the 48 years, um, 48 years old mother of 17 year old Tasha. Tasha mm -hmm. was yesterday admitted to the local hospital mental health unit with first onset psychosis. You have spoken to psych uh, register in the hospital who assure you that she is already improving and will likely only require a short stay in hospital and some community follow-up. Her mother came to see you with vague complaint about not being able to sleep. So task is uh, to take relevant history and explain mom's concern. Perfect. So basically you understand that 17 year old Tasha is currently admitted with an episode of psychosis in the hospital yeah. and mom is coming and she has got some questions. Mom is Barbara, who is going to be me and I may have some questions for you. So think about it, think about the framework, some key questions. We're not gonna spend a lot of time here and then we'll sure. move on, okay? All right. You ready? <laughs> Can I know how many, how like, um, is it three minute history or four minute history? Normally you got two minutes to read the tasks and read the scenario. And then it's about eight minutes performance time. Uh, so history taking six minute or- Oh, I mean, it's up. Yeah, it's not it's not time from that point of view. You've got eight minutes in s once the scenarios start. All right. All right. Okay. So I'm Barbara. Hi, doctor. Uh, hi, this is Dr. Romana, one of the doctor here. So how may I help you, Barbara? Yes, uh, doctor. Thanks for seeing me. It's such short notice. Look, I'm very concerned about Tasha. Um, you know, she had a bit of a ruckus a couple of days ago, and I don't know what happened and what got to her. She was just completely out of her. Uh, mind and she was shouting and she was raising a mm -hmm. like she was chanting and you know one of the neighbors called and mm -hmm. they called the police the police came in they called the ambulance the ambulance mm -hmm. had to actually sedate her because she was trying to assault the ambulance and police mm -hmm. and then she was brought into the hospital and you know uh, because of the COVID situation we've not been allowed to come and meet you know our relatives Mm -hmm. And I've not really heard back. I did try to call a few times to the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. And they said that somebody will come back to me, but nobody's come back to me. So I really, really appreciate you taking time to talk to me. Um, and Tasha has been just not herself for the last few months. Uh, I don't know what's going on. She's been very angry, staying up most nights, talking to herself uh, mm -hmm. at times. She's just just not well. I, I, I'm not sure that what's going on, doctor. Barbara, um, it's very. Um, I'm really sorry to know that has happened with you and your girl, and I'm really sorry uh, the whole situation what happened with Tasha. But Barbara, the decision that you have made to talk with me and you came came here to talk with me, it's very good decision that you have made. Okay, I'm appreciating that. So, and I can tell you, Barbara, Tasha is already in the hospital and already doctor um, looked at her and gave some uh, treatment. So you can um, relax, okay? 
I um you can you can yeah you can depend on me and you can trust me as a doctor and uh, whatever what's going do? on um uh, Dr. Romana like uh, what's going to happen uh, so the task Dr. Romana here is to take the relevant history so you're going to ask me Tasha's mom questions which will help you understand what is leading to all that okay so I'll let you do that you got two minutes yes so uh, please don't get upset. Um, I'll be asking you a few questions. Um, and uh, whatever we'll be discussing today will be strictly confidential, Barbara, unless mm -hmm. it's harmful to you and others. And uh, I'm, I'm appreciating that you you explain everything and you you open up with me. And so, Barbara, uh, can you please tell me, is it first time that uh, made you re uh, really feel like the, that way, how you're feeling now? Yeah, it's not the first time that Tash has gone in through these kind of episode. It has been ongoing issue for the last couple of years. We've seen a psychologist at a few occasions. Um, and we were meant to be seeing a psychiatrist, I think, at one point. But Tash has just not, you know, been engaged as much. And she's constantly been putting all these appointments. Um, I think uh, it all started when uh, me and my partner separated um, and Tash was very close uh, to her father. He had moved interested and has no longer maintained any contact and I could see some visible changes in her personality from that point of view. Um, mm. Tash also started to engage in some sort of drug activity, I've been told by a few of her friends, and that has really deteriorated her mental health. Um, she was initially working in Coles. Um, but she's quit her jobs. She's uh, home all day, not eating well. She's lost a lot of weight, staying up all night. Um, the psychologists were concerned that she may have some anxiety and depression. Um, but, you know, it's just in the last few months, she's just completely deteriorated. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Barbara, I'm um, really sorry that happened with you. And by asking this question, I got to know that uh, you have some family issue that you, um, Tasha went through a few days ago. And I'm really sorry to know that. And also, which you have mentioned that she uh, got used to is some drugs. Um, it's uh, also very, uh, you know, um, it's also very much uh, distressing situation for you. I can't even imagine. Please don't get upset, OK? And uh, please rely on me. I'll see what what will happen. I'll and I'll try to give you the best management. Okay, all right. Okay. So, uh, uh, like, tell me, like, um, how is you? Uh, how you are coping up with this situation? Well, I'm not. I, I I was just as I said that yesterday she was out of bounds, and I had to, you know, um, the neighbors called the ambulance on uh, police on her because they've had enough. Mm -hmm. So Barbara, I can tell you that she is on the, um, uh, she is in hospital and uh, you, um, and she, she already some doctor, uh, she, uh, already some doctor um, uh, visited her and gave her some medication and uh, gave her treatment. So, um, so you, you please don't get upset. All right. All right, Barbara. Yeah. So what's going to happen next? That's... Uh... Yeah. Yes, I'll be telling you, um, she will get the proper treatment. Uh, just before that, may I ask you a few questions, like how is your mood these days and how is your sleep and appetite? Oh, her sleep and appetite is very affected. She's not eating and drinking all that. Okay, um, so um, how, is, how is your mood and how is your sleep and appetite? May I know? My mood and appetite? Yes. My mood is fine. Okay, so um, tell me, like, um, uh, did you did you ever feel? Uh, is it for the first time that yeah, made you really or it or it happened with you before the Tasha's uh, illness? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Is it the first time that happened with you that you are feeling or it or it happened before as well for any other time that you are fe really feeling or it, which I can see. Oh, look, I mean, I've, I've been worried and I've been taking her to all the appointments. Um, so I've taken her to psychologists a few times. I've taken her to booked an appointment to psychiatrists. I've been taking her regularly to the GP as well. I have been concerned all along. As I said, uh, ever since um, we separated, I have been engaged quite a lot uh, um, to yeah. have the bet, uh, best outcome for Tash. But she is just, you know, deteriorating. So I guess one of my questions is what's going to happen next? When is she going to come back from the hospital and what's going to happen next? What are the plans? Sure, I'll be explaining you one by one. Just, um, I just need to know, uh, as I know that as a mom, you are, uh, you will have a lot of responsibility for Tasha's health condition. So yes, doctor, I just need yeah. To, yeah, so I just need to need a health checkup on you. Will that be all right? I'll just ask you a few questions. 
it's not me it's tasha uh, sure um i will be um, just just i need to ask you a few question of you and your for your daughter will that be all right since you are already here we can have a good health check up what do you think for me yeah i don't require health check up okay uh, so tell me like uh, how is the, how is her condition like uh, how is her uh, i think we'll stop here i think we missed right. the point i think we missed the point here and i think this is uh, um and uh, you know it's is it it's, the mother condition or is the daughter's condition <laughs> oh look i mean i think what i understand it's it's the mother is came to i mean she's not been able to sleep well because of tasha okay yeah. and she needs to have her concerns answered which is regarding regarding tasha so i think when you taking the relevant history i know it's a bit confusing when you taking the relevant history i wanted you to ask the mental health information for tasha which i was giving you that we went through the breakup and tasha was very emotionally close yeah. to the father and since then her mental health has deteriorated and i've been engaging with all the mental health work up and you know psychologists and psychiatrists and yeah. gps um that was good you you did that quite well um the other thing i wanted to just go through if there's any organic illness so where, remember whenever you're dealing with a psychotic patient you ask any organic like is there any medical issues with tasha all right has she had any medical problems diabetes or headaches or anything like that go for it yeah yeah i just want to know because tasha is already diagnosed with psycho uh, like psychosis acute psychosis so mm -hmm. shall we um, go for the diagnosis for uh, acute psychosis or we, sh we should rule out mother's anxiety this is the this is the problem of mm -hmm. this case mm -hmm. this case uh, uh, sorry sorry don't sorry go for it yeah Omar. so this case does come uh, like romana is saying uh, in which the mother is coming either with anxiety or the mother is coming with depression yeah um and also you have to you have to see both things uh, there's a case that comes also with the child having uh, the symptoms and you have to manage the child but there's also a case like romana is saying that of the mother um it comes in different ways there's this case where the child has psychosis there's one case where the child has uh, is going through pornography and there are quite a few cases like that where you're actually dealing with the mother like in this the stem is that her mother comes to see you with big complaints so uh, the case comes in both ways so I shall i start so this with is, the daughter is, and then end with yeah. the mother so basically yeah. this is a case which is slightly modified so that's the th thing with the recalls so when you get the recall you've almost almost got an understanding i need to talk to the mother how are in this space in particular you need to talk about tasha what's going to happen so the concerns explore mom concerns it's about tasha i think it should have been worded better that mom's concern is what has happened to tasha in the hospital she came in with in psychosis she's now relaxing she needs community mental health follow up she also needs a psychiatric engagement she will need to have a contingency planning if she goes through any psychotic episode what are my access what are my help points who do i need to call and normally comet team like a community mental health team they give you all that vital information so uh, that's why i was saying that yes she is diagnosed with psychosis but for the first presentation of psychosis please make that as a golden rule you must quickly ask through organic questions any headache any hormonal treatments or any drug induced issues like is she am i'm giving you clues here that she's been taking drugs so there might be a drug and alcohol engagement in here so you need to quickly check up like she got any headache any chest pain and respiratory issues smoking what is she smoking how much is she smoking uh, any illicit drug intake yes she's alcohol she's uh, you know methamphetamine whatever it is and then we need to engage her in drug and alcohol so the relevant history is just quickly going through that snapshots snapshots of then you can other also cause of, uh, other cause of other cause of acute psychosis that's right because she's presented for the first time to the hospital right. community wise she's been engaged yes definitely the diagnosis is psychosis there might be an underlying mental health issues she's going through some situational crisis with the family but you need to just make sure that you have got a holistic approach because that's what you do practically and that will demonstrate to the examiner and to the patient as well that you're thinking from every direction then once you've done that then you make a plan look mental health people have seen her psychiatrists have seen her we're thinking of discharging her these are the three things i want you to remember when you will go home you'll have these contact information from the community mental health from a drug and alcohol and from the psychiatric these are the appointments we've already made for tasha so you're already doing a tremendous job and you need to keep on engaging second i want to make sure that you keep your link with the gp open if there's any issues the gp can always monitor and even medicate because they can keep the follow up on that all right some sort of 
triggers like if there's a particular trigger which sets Sasha off, you can go and explore that avenue as well. That if there's anything in particular, like if there's anything in particular in terms of drugs, which is obviously triggering in this case, then try to engage more with the drug and alcohol team and try minimize that exposure. Obviously, that's also very important. So it's it's it, that's the dilemma, and always teach in my courses that when you're doing the recalls, the information can be a bit patchy <laughs> and sometimes you can completely misread and the examiner will say okay fine so because in the last exam we were talking to Tasha's mom you're still talking to Tasha's mom six months later <laughs> but that's good look I really like your approach in terms of you know breaking up and being very one thing I'd say once you develop a repo as Dr. Fatma was saying as well you need to move on you you, you were asking and repeating the same thing over and over again once you've developed the repo you need to just bang on bang 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 your task Romana is to pass the station. And that can only happen when you take the relevant history and you explore my concern. No matter how much repo you develop, every two minutes, every 30 seconds, it's not going to get you across the line. What's going to get you across the line is the task completion. So do that. You've got good communication skills. You've got very calm attitude, but just make sure that you have got those essential ingredients of completing the task. Any questions from anyone? Yes. So at the end, shall we address mother's uh, situation? Since mother That would be excellent. Had... So if you got like, and at the same time, you can say, look, I can recognize that you are also very concerned. You're not being able to sleep well. Um, I would like to go. I would like you to go and see your GP. And, uh, and, you know, engage in conversation with the GP. What strategies can we do? Okay. Okay, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Romana. I really appreciate it. We'll move ahead. Crash on. Dr. Romana is going to do this scenario. We'll take it from there. Dr. Romana, you're on. Who's going to do the scenario now? Anybody can do. I'll be an easy examiner. I promise I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Sonali. Dr. Sonali, would you like to go ahead? Just want to click off the scenario. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sonali. There's your scenario. Would you like to read through, please? Uh, your next patient in your GP practice is 30-year-old Malcolm, who presents as uh, he wants advice on how to give up smoking. He has attended the practice before for some minor health issues that have all resolved. He does not have any medical conditions and does not take any medications. Your tasks counsel the patient on smoking cessation, answer all questions the patient may ask, you do not have to take history nor examine the patient. Your interaction will be with Malcolm. Okay. So would you like your two minutes to start now? Uh, yes, please. Okay, start. Let me know when you're ready for ready earlier. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, let's start. Eight minutes is on. Uh, good afternoon, Malcolm. I'm Dr. Roy, one of the GPs in this GP practice. Uh, I see from my notes that you want to discuss about smoking cessation. Is that right? Yeah, doctor. I, I thought I'd come and see you. It's been some oh, time. That's a, that's a good approach. Um, so... In this session, we will talk about how we can help you uh, in, your, in your journey to stop smoking, as well as we will answer some of the questions that you might have today. Yeah, uh, is, yeah. this, is it okay to start? Yeah, yeah, sure, doctor. All right. Uh, so I reckon you have been smoking for a very long time. May I know for how long? Uh, yeah, doctor, it's been 30 years. Okay. Uh, and how many cigarettes have you been smoking? Per day. I don't usually count, but something between 25 to 30. Okay. Um, 
Well, it's a very brave decision to stop smoking. At, now, that is the first step that you are motivated to sm uh, stop the smoking. Yeah. And there are many help available for you to uh, assist you in this journey. Uh, to start with, we will uh, take a gradual approach. Um, well, some of the studies do show that uh, gradual approach might not work. So you'll have to stop uh, smoking cigarettes altogether. So you'll have to go what we term it as a cold turkey. Mm -hmm. So you will stop smoking and then we will uh, offer you alternate methods. Now there are some nicotine patches, nicotine gums, which you can chew and then put nicotine patches put on your uh, arm or your back. That will help you to uh, curb the craving a bit. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there are some uh, social groups as well. Uh, same people who are in the same journey as for stopping uh, smoking. Mm -hmm. And there are psychological support available as well. Uh, and then you can have a chat with anyone who is going through the similar situation. Uh, at this stage, do you have any other questions for me? Um, so doctor, uh, what if it doesn't work? Well, um, it is possible because the journey is very difficult due to uh, cravings as well as uh, this being a habit. Um, the people do uh, come across relapses and uh, it while the, that is possible the first step of uh, the motivation is uh, very crucial the fact that you want to keep at it and as well as the psychological uh, support that you will receive from us uh, is also very important so that you can uh, go on now i uh, i'd like to uh, uh, point out that there would be some withdrawal symptoms as well while you are uh, trying to give up smoking uh, mm -hmm. that will be uh, you'll feel more lethargic you'll you'll feel that you don't have the energy to uh, go on do about your tasks you'll miss the habit um, and then uh, maybe uh, if you see or smell anyone else smoking you'll feel like grabbing a cigarette as well mm -hmm. uh, while that is uh, that can happen, uh, it's crucial that you um, focus on why you decided to quit smoking in the first um, in the first instance, and mm -hmm. um, and to also curb the craving. We have the nicotine supplements as well. Now, mm -hmm. if the supplements uh, do not work, there is uh, a method that instead of smoking cigarettes you can wean down to uh, electronic cigarettes, which has got filters, have got less concentration of nicotine. Uh, so uh, that would be a gradual measure to cut down on cigarettes. Right. Do, you, do you have any other questions for me? Um, so doctor, uh, when can I start? We can start immediately. Um, to start with, I can uh, I'll give you reading materials on to the uh, for you to be motivated to keep up with the uh, smoking cessation. Mm -hmm. I'll give you reading materials on the good uh, aspects of smoking cessation, as well as um, how it will benefit you, benefit uh, people in your family to stay away from the secondhand smoke uh, due to your smoking. Uh, as well as um, the immediate benefits of stopping the smoking is that your um, life expectancy uh, increases and in 10 years time, your life expect expectancy would be the same as a non-smoker. So that is a good motivator. Um, and yeah, and I will introduce you to the social group where everyone will talk about how uh, they have achieved uh, the uh, giving up smoking and what they did. Mm. So, doctor, besides uh, besides this, is there anything else that I should do? Anything else I should try? Uh, yep, uh, I'll give you a referral to a psychologist as well uh, mm -hmm. to help you with this uh, sm smoking cessation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And like I've tried to do it before, doctor, three four times actually to tell you the truth, mm -hmm. um, but. It just, I just can't control myself and it all happens again. And 
uh, I don't know, within a few days I'm back uh, on the bandwagon. And what do you think um, I should do to avoid that? How can I stop it from happening? Uh, we have a few medications that mm -hmm. will uh, uh, help you to crave less. Um, at this stage, I cannot recall the medications, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, they will help you uh, curb the cravings. Okay. okay. Anything else that you'd like to tell me, doctor? Um, just that I would like to see you in, uh, in a week's time, uh, in two weeks time, after you have attended your psychological sessions, uh, as well as meet up you with your uh, social groups. And we have started you on the medications and the patches nicotine gums. And I'd like to ref, uh, review you uh, based on your improvements and what you're finding difficult. And then we'll go on from there. All right, all right. Thank you so much, doctor. Perfect. That was very good, Dr. Sanari. I think uh, I, I'm surprised how when you put or take away the time constraints, everybody's a star. <laughs> well, she Excellent. did it actually in seven minutes. She, she did, okay. All right. Well, that's a, even, even better then. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanali. How do you feel, Dr. Sanali, doing the scenario? Um, obviously, the time is an issue. And mm. um, when the question comes up, all the information gets jumbled up. So Staying That's in a right. format is a struggle, definitely. Mm -hmm. And um, um, again, the format is, I think that's the main struggle. Like that's, everyone that's a has practice the knowledge, thing, right? but going in a more systematic way is difficult. And once you've practiced that over and over again, looks like that you may have done this scenario once before a while back, but if you keep on doing it, I say that three rules of three, if you do it scenario once, you do it scenario twice, you do it scenario three, you don't have to ever do it ever in your life. So practice, yeah. practice and practice. Okay, we'll jump on. I'll get Dr. Saman to take the next case because I think she's been waiting for a while. And uh, Dr. Saman, can you start your case? Who's going to be volunteering for the next case? Anybody? Uh, by this time, you probably all realize that we are very friendly. Dr. Samia, do, would you like to go through? Uh, yeah, as a role player. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a role player, yeah. doing the scenario. Okay, excellent. Dr. Samia, so this is your scenario. Dr. Saman, you take on, please. Sure. So your two minutes, Samia, go ahead. You can read it loud, Dr. Samia, so everybody can listen. All right, so your next patient in the emergency department is a 45-year-old Tom. He was playing soccer when uh, he twisted his ankle. Uh, he was initially unable to bear the weight, but now hobbling four step in your ED. So you are presenting an examination and treatment strategy to the medical student. Tom is stable and comfortable at rest. He does not require immediate attention. All right, so explain the examination technique and imaging modality to the student and provide a treatment plan. That's right. All right, so twisted his ankle. So medical student, yeah. So ankle and modality to the examination provide treatment plan. All right. Tamiya, your two minutes are up. You can yeah, start. all right, I can start, yeah. All right, uh, hello, this is Dr. Samya, one of the doctors working here. So I can see from the notes that uh, you are a medical student, right? Yes, doctor. All right, so how can I address you? You will call me Neil. Neil, Neil, it's very nice to meet you. So how are you doing and how about you study doing? I'm 
Doing good, doctor. How are you? And how are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And that's uh, very good to hear that your study is doing fine. And I'm very happy that you are with me today and you want to learn about like how to examine a patient. Uh, actually, here in emergency department, we have a patient like 45-year-old Tom and he presented here with a twisting uh, of his ankle. All right. Yes. So now, like we are going to uh, examine him, and uh, like uh, what could be the uh, possible consequence of this twisting to the ankle. Now, before any examination, Neil, what would be the common approach? We need to introduce ourselves to the patient. We need to like uh, explain the patient what we are going to do with them and why, and we need proper positioning and exposure, right? Yes. So after doing that, if the patient give us consent, so we are going to start with our examination after washing our hand. And also it's very important to ensure like patient is in pain free before starting the examination. So we can offer him painkiller as well after excluding that he has no history of allergy to painkiller medication. Do you get that, Neil? Yes, doctor. Here we have already checked patient and he's doing fine and he's stable at this moment. So we are going to start with the examination. So I'm going to tell you like what could be the steps here. First of all, we are going to have a general look at the patient. Like patient is sitting comfortably or not. Is the patient is having any kind of working aid or protective posture. All right. Yes. So we can quickly recheck the patient vitals. Yeah, that would involve us to check the pulse, blood pressure, temperature and respiratory rate and oxygen saturation. Got it? Yeah. All right, the next thing that we are going to do the inspection of the ankle joint. So we are going to compare the both ankle joint and we're going to first do the inspection in standing position. So we are going to look for on inspection, what are the skin condition, any redness, any swelling, any visible deformity and any muscle bursting. Do you get that? Yes. All right, so from the front, we are going to look that part. So from the uh, like side or lateral view, we're going to look for like what are the condition of medial and lateral malleolus, which are the bony prominence of the lower part of both side of the ankle. Do you get that? Yeah. Also, we're going to look for what are the condition of the arc, like medial and lateral arc of the foot. Okay. Yes. From the back side, we're going to look for what are the condition of the uh, a, a tendon Achilles, which is the largest tendon on the back part, lower part of your ankle. All right, any discontinuity or any sign of injury or redness over there. Next thing we are going to uh, like request the patient to lie down. Here we are going to inspect the whole foot. Like what are the like any uh, sign of injury, any ulcer, or any kind of you can say sign of trauma there. All right, what are yeah. the condition of the medial and longitudinal arc? So these are all the point of inspection. After doing the inspection, next thing we're going to do is the palpation. So here before palpation, what are the point we need to look for? I'm going to say you, like we need to look for temperature, we need to look for tenderness, we need to look for like the pulse and capillary refilling time. So while checking the tender uh, temperature, we're going to use the back of our uh, hand, like we are going to back, uh, use that. Compare, we are going to like uh, feel for local rates of temperature or not. And we're going to compare the, uh, like, uh, the point above and below the injured part. After looking the temperature, we are going to look for the tenderness. So make sure before looking the tenderness, how about the patient current pain condition? Is the patient is comfortable uh, while checking that or not? Okay, Neil? Yes. All right, so what are the point we need to look for for tenderness? We follow a rule here that is we call ankle or to a rule. We're going to check tenderness over the medial and lateral malleolus and six centimeter area above that point. We're going to look for like uh, the uh, uh, base of the fifth metatarsal bone over the navicular bone. And we are going to also observe like how about like patient uh, taking the proper steps while coming to the ED. So any of that uh, point tenderness is present and if patient is not able to like bear the weight while well, we are uh, like observing the patient stepping towards the emergency department, it worries we need to do some imaging uh, of the ankle joint, like ankle series x-ray we need to do to find out like what could be the abnormality there. Do you get that? Yes, doctor. All right, lovely. After that, we're going to look for the capillary filling time and that uh, would involve us to press over the great toe of the nail and we are going to Press it over five seconds and release the pressure afterwards. So we're going to look for like is uh, the initial pallor color after pressing uh, that return to the normal red color, which should be less than two seconds. Do you get that? 
So yes. this is like the normal copper refilling time and there will be no underlying vascular compromise. So the next thing that we are going to do uh, is the pulse. So here we're going to look for uh, arterial dorsalis pedis pulse. We're going to look it over the uh, like first uh, metatarsal space uh, and the lateral to the external hallux is longer stained over the navicular bone. And the posterior tibial pulse, we're going to look for just below and behind the medial malleolus. Do you get that? Yep. All right, that's good. Now, the next thing is to looking for the movement of the ankle. So what are the ankle movement? We are going to look for active movement and passive movement. If patient is able to move the ankle joint actively, we're going to look for like dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion and eversion, okay? Yep. So we're going to look that. For checking the dorsiflexion, we're going to say the patient move your foot towards your body. For checking the plantar flexion, we're going to say the patient move your foot down to the ground. And for checking the inversion, we're going to say the patient move your both foot like that way, both of your soul face each other. And while checking the inversion, we're going to say the patient move your foot outward where the soul is like uh, moving opposite to each other. Do you get that? Yep. So this is the movement that we need to check. Next thing, we're going to do a couple of specific or special tests here. First test that we're going to do is the windlass test. So for this test, we're going to uh, like a, a, uh, we are going to do the dorsiflexion of the great toe, and with the index finger of our right hand, we're going to tap on the uh, just uh, sole. Okay, so if the patient complain of pain, this could be the, like the sign of plantar fasciitis. And in uh, that same way, if we uh, put pressure on the heel, that could be suggestive of a cancal a calcaneal spar. Do you get that? Yep. All right, the next thing we're going to do for like the uh, Mulder sign test, uh, that is like for mortal neuroma, present or not. So here we are going to press with our index and the thumb over the third, fourth, second, third, fourth uh, Time is uh, wave space. Oh, oh my God. Sorry. Do you want me to continue? You can complete your station and after that, <laughs> give you the feedback. Uh, if you allow me, then I can continue. Uh, okay, sure, you can. But All right, so that is like... Minutes. You have two more minutes and you have to wrap two more up. All right, so with uh, with uh, uh, we are going to press here over the second, third and fourth web space to look for like any thickening of the nerve tissue there. So that if that present and patient complain of pain, it could be suggestive of motor neuroma. Next so thing... Is relevant here? Yeah, here if it's like motor neuroma, patient will have pain on tenderness on that specific point. Uh, so, doctor, I, from the scenario, I got that this patient had twisted his ankle. So, checking for molten neuroma, is that relevant in emergency? Uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, actually here, what we're going to focus on, like we're going to do the, um, uh, you can say some uh, syndesmosis quiz test. Yes. So, uh, go, that test will involve, like, uh, uh, we are going to uh, put the ankle uh, with our both between our both palm and we're going to squeeze downward uh, to the upper part of the ankle so after doing that squeezing test if the patient complain of pain we can think about like twisted ankle would be more specific uh, diagnosis here so uh, doctor what does the syndesmosis squeeze tell you Tell me, like, if there is the like a uh, syndesmosis that is, we can say, thick membrane that hold uh, the lower part of uh, the uh, our leg bone that is like tibia and fibula. So, if there is like any uh, inflammation and is any injury there, so that could be like we can found positive tenderness after squeezing test. Okay, and are there any other special tests you would like to do? <clears throat> yeah, all right, so here we can do some uh, ligament testing uh, that is like the teller tail test. Uh, and another one is the, uh, you can say anterior droid test. All right, so here doing the anterior droid test, we're going to place one hand just below the, uh, our elbow. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, it's just below our heel. And we are going to place another hand in the lower part of the, uh, our leg. So we are going to put upward pressure over the uh, heel and downward pressure over the lower part of the ankle. If there is uh, anterior ligament instability, so patient can have uh, pain and we can, uh, uh, move the heel easily upward. And while doing the talar tail test, we're going to look for certain ligament stability like anterior talofibular, posterior talofibular, and calconofibular ligament. Do you get that? How do we check those ligaments? Yeah, all right. So that ligament, like for checking the calconofibular ligament, patient should be in sitting position, hanging down the leg. And we're going to like move the ankle joint <clears throat> 
like inversion and eversion. Okay, uh, so here it, it, uh, while doing the inversion, we can feel a um, gap or instability feeling uh, in the calconofibular uh, calcone ligament site. And while checking the anterior talofibular ligament, we are going to passively do the dorsiflexion and inversion while checking the posterior talofibular ligament stability. We are going to do the passively plantar flexion and uh, inversion. Uh, so here we are going to, uh, I'm going to consult with my senior as well and the specialist and I'm going to arrange uh, to do some ankle x-ray series to find out like what could be the possibilities or MRI uh, to find out like any ligament inj injury there. Or uh, we can do also the ultrasound, focus ultrasound uh, and the just treatment plan, it will be like uh, we can uh, uh, advise the patient to take a uh, breast and uh, ankle splint that will move the ankle uh, super rest and physiotherapy and uh, painkiller. Okay. So in total, you have taken 12 minutes. Okay. So firstly, Samia, you have done really good. You started off very well. You built a repo. That was good. You followed the vibe approach very well. But when you told that you have to properly position the leg and do the proper exposure, you should mention what is the proper exposure in this case. Oh. Okay, so you have to mention that we will ask the patient to roll up their uh, trousers so that at yeah. least we can see up to the mid calf or yeah. ideally the joint above the joint that's involved up to the yeah. knee. Oh. Okay, so you did mention about the exposure, but you did not tell that what is the ideal exposure in this case. Oh. Okay, pain that was very good. You told about the general appearance, again, very good. You did the vitals, very nice. You told about the inspection of ankle. So when you were talking about inspection, you told about a general inspection of the foot, anteriorly what you will see medially or laterally. But in these examination scenarios, what you are expected to do is to tell the relevant findings that you are expecting to see in this case. So in this case, you should have told that you will look for any deformity, swelling, redness, any open wound, any color changes, any cyanosis. And on palpation, you will be looking for the cold peripheries and capillary refill. All right. Even a better approach is that before you, as you're talking to a medical doctor who is just a junior doctor than you, a medical student, yeah. and simply uh, tell them that wh what the differentials. This patient has presented with a twisted ankle. So you are thinking of ligamentous injuries. He is having great one. He is able to walk in the emergency. He is taking four steps. So this is what we call as grade one injury strain. It means that this patient has a ligamentous injury. His bones are intact. He does not have any fracture. He does not have total ankle subluxation or dislocation. This is simply a ligamentous injury. And even in that, it is not a complete tear of the ligament. It is a partial tear of the ligament. The diagnosis is given. I have told you that this is a grade one strain. The patient is able to take four steps. Yeah. Be very clear what is your diagnosis here. And now your whole examination is to rule out that how will you check the ankle integrity. So the things that you are telling, they are, they are all very good. Like they're not wrong or anything, but they should be tailored to this particular case. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Like I need to focus on that's the ligament testing. The scenario, that, yes, yeah, the yeah. scenario that is given. Yeah, you, sorry. According to it. So yeah. again, in palpation, you covered temperature very well. You covered the Otava ankle rules, which was a critical error. If you had not, you did that. That was very nice. You covered pul pulses. That was very good. You had to mention that I will definitely confirm the neurovascular bundle. Yeah. You did uh, pulses. When you did movements, you have done the motor component of the nerves but you forgot the sensory component of the nerves. Oh. Okay. You did not mention that you will check sensations in this patient. And that was important because you will check the neurovascular component. Yeah, all right, I got it, yeah. And then you missed all the special tests that were particular because your time was already finished by the time you started telling them. Yeah, yeah. The fasciitis was not relevant in this case. Motor neuroma was not relevant in this case. Achilles rupture, Achilles tendonitis, it was not relevant in this case. You were not supposed to tell whole foot examination. You were supposed to tell how you will examine the integrity of ankle in this particular case. 
inspection findings that you will be particularly looking in this case. While patient findings, you will be particularly looking in this case. So that yeah. was, then in the imaging modalities, you mentioned ultrasound, but more than that, I think a uh, first is when you mentioned that ankle Otava rules and therefore basically x-rays. So you have to tell the x-rays that you can take the AP view, lateral view and ankle mortis view. And not only that, to explain the ankle mortis view here as well, that it is basically an AP view, but the leg is directly internally rotated up to 15 to 20 degrees. So that all the three bones, tibia, fibula, and talus that form the ankle joint, you can see all the all those three bones. If these three bones are equidistant from one another, it means that the ankle joint is absolutely normal. And if there is an unequal distance, it means that the ankle joint's integrity is compromised. Yeah. And uh, then was a treatment plan. So that in treatment plan, you had to mention rice approach, rest, ice, compress, and And When given as a task, you have to tell the value of each and everything. Why you are asking the patient to rest, why you are putting ice, why you are asking the patient for the compression which mostly students forget that it is to prevent the lymphedema, et cetera. And then uh, why elevate and how much to elevate? You have to mention that you will ask the patient to elevate six to 10 inches. And then early physiotherapy and early mobilization because it is a partial tear. Mm. So yeah. that's all from my side. It was yeah. excellent. Thank yeah, you that so is, much. No, no, that's excellent, Dr. Saman and do both Dr. Samia. Um, I think that is... Dr. Saman has made some excellent points, and yes. uh, I, I I completely agree with her. Obviously, she's uh, recently um, you know passed the exam, and she didn't know how. The other thing is that uh, although your theoretical knowledge was exemplary, yeah. like yep. I could see the flow, and I was like almost wow, this is yep. amazing. But Dr. Saman made a very crucial point that you need to apply the components of those theoretical knowledge to the scenario at hand, which is already telling you that she's able to take four step. And we're dealing practically with a, either a sprained angle or perhaps a small subtle fracture, which can be missed. So I think that is the mindset we need to have. There's a history in place, there's an injury in place, and there's a diagnostic value from that. And that's what we sort of were wondering that when you read the scenario, you make a diagnosis in your mind, and then you provide all the reassurance from that. So yes, you went through the Ottawa ankle rule, which was good. You go through the painkillers, analgesia, and as I said, neurovascular bundle, both motor and sensory component, plus checking the dorsal spiritus, popliteal, uh, sorry, dorsal spiritus and posterior tibial is very important as well. And make men make sure that you mention them. Um, and one thing I did uh, note in terms of imaging, I agree with Dr. Saman. I think this is a patient who's come to emergency. When the patients come to emergency, we don't have an access to MRI scan nor do we have access to ultrasound in most scenarios. So this is a very practical tip. Working as an emergency physician myself, I would certainly be doing an X-ray uh, with a concern that there might be an undisplaced talus fracture. Uh, and with the mortise view, you can have a look at the talar bone. And obviously with the contingency advice that if it was not to get better after the RICE approach in like four days time or five days time, you can go ahead and do a CT scan or MRI scan. But don't put words into patients' thought process. Get them to follow over the GP for a secondary assessment, and then they can plan the next investigation up. Because no matter what you're doing, you have to justify that. So if you say MRI scan, the patient would say, why not an MRI scan now? And then exam, you don't have time to argue about, I don't have an MRI scan and things like that. You need to be very clear in terms of what you are offering and why you're offering to exclude any, like any fracture. That is a fair game. And then follow up if things don't improve, then the GP can request the further necessary imaging, which could be MRI, CT scan, or an ultrasound, depending on what the findings at that point might be. Does it make sense, Dr. Samia? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you All so right, much. Excellent. For but this. Thank you very much for your input. That was excellent. Um, I think time-wise, we're going quite... Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, stop doing the scenarios. We'll just cover some of the other... Um, points about thank you, Dr. Saman. That was excellent. Thank you, <laughs> Your input was amazing, and Dr. Amar as well. I'll just uh, uh, sum up this, this, uh, the session today. Uh, I've got a few things that, uh, in terms of when you're doing, obviously, some of the candidates uh, have approached me and they're doing the exam. Uh, when you're doing an online examination in terms of preparation, uh, we always go through these uh, few points uh, that how to dress, dress formally. 
but appropriate colors. Don't be too flashy. Um, I think Dr. Saman and Dr. Mara can reflect on, have a very neutral and earthen colors if you're doing an online exam and make sure that uh, you know your background is light so you wear dark and if your background is dark you wear light or vice versa you so you're prominent it's all about how you present yourself your facial expression and you don't want to be you know be at it at any disadvantage when you're doing an online exam all right um obviously children are always near and dear to all of us but make sure when you're doing an exam they are hidden somewhere in the cupboard all right. So they're not out and rent. Some of the friends who have done the online exam, they've actually taken an effort of going through the hotels or uh, to a completely secluded place. So make sure that you, when you're going to the hotel or any other place, you've got a stable internet connection and you can confine to the examination tool in terms of, you know, doing the round circle of showing everything in your access. And from that point of view, you are confirming to the AMC guidelines for the online examination. Uh, you can use some extra lights, uh, although AMC has not got any restrictions to any extra light, but just make sure that you have got that in your view. So if there's any contra, like if they're not happy with that, you can turn them out and put them away, store them away. Um, all right, and make sure your computer, laptop, needless to say, camera is good. Um, whatever your Zoom sessions are, make sure that working and your account is working, check them, make sure that you're not, you know what? Recently, somebody told me that the computer went through an update. So please, please, if you've got a laptop, update your software, uh, all right? My computer is prompting me for an update for about a month now, but I'm not updating because I'm not got a time. But if you've got an update, make sure that you've done an update, okay? And you've given your computer a few dry runs, okay? Uh, headphones and mics are good. Um, nowadays, uh, um, the, the computer audio quality is good, but excellent through headphones. There will be no interference. There will be no background noise. And sometimes you can get these noise cancellation headphones and they are amazing. Uh, make sure you are widely connected because then you won't have to worry about, you know, the battery running out in terms of Bluetooth connection because some of these exams can really go on for a very long time and you can't just keep on taking them off and taking them on. So make sure that you've got a long wire when you connect into the computer. Um, yeah, seat and desk good posture i always recommend that you have got at least you know your chest above visible and your hands are visible in the show so you know they are able to see you how you're presenting yourself you're using your hand and that overall puts a framework of your non-verbal communication cues um and yes do a trial run with your partner husband friend you know enemy whoever whoever you can find do a trial run and get them to critique you if there's anything which can be improved before the final exam um all right okay and you know make sure you speak clearly one of the things which i'm very happy to see all of the people are speaking very clearly they've got good pace of rhythm they're using overtone and undertones that is amazing anything else dr Saman or dr mara you would like to add on in terms of online preparation uh, i think you've summed it up uh, quite well one of the few things that um, i wanted to discuss also in my own case as well as in all of these that you've mentioned start with an open-ended question that's gold, because if you let the candidate speak, the role player speak, they will give you a lot of information and you don't have to you know, go about guessing things. Um, also, as you mentioned, the handbook is the Bible. Um, they tell you in the handbook when to give guarded reassurance. They tell you in the handbook when to draw, especially for the prostate case. I think that if you just draw, draw that, it gives uh, the patient a better understanding. So yeah, just uh, some of the things that, and I think in the course, I've done the course. So I am watching for the course. Um, I have to say that uh, it really helps with your communication because everyone has the knowledge and you can get the notes and everything from everywhere. Um, but just refining that knowledge and knowing that in that seven, eight minutes, what do you have to say? Because you can go on, I, like in some of the cases, someone went up to 12 minutes, someone went up to 15 minutes even. But, you know, being concise and being able to convey in seven minutes, that's really important. And I really uh, learned that through um, my experience from the course. So yeah, I think that's important for everybody to understand. And I think we've seen that time management is uh, one of the things which remains a challenge uh, in most part. Dr. Saman, have you got anything else, any pearls of wisdom to share, please? I said no pearls of wisdom, but yes, I would like to add a bit about the examination stations. There was, uh, I have seen that students are a bit confused about the online examination. So there are primarily two different types of physical examination stations. Number one are, those in which they will have already given you the diagnosis. So they will be like the patient was in a motor vehicle accident. He has presented to you in the emergency. He was having shortness of breath. 
you have done the chest X-ray. He has been diagnosed with 25% of pneumothorax. Now you're dealing with a medical student and you have to tell the medical student how you will do the examination in this case. So you already know the diagnosis. Now what they are expecting you, number one, you, you have to tell that when you're doing the examination, what will be the positive findings that you will find? They've already told you that this is pneumothorax cases. What will be the positive findings? And number two, that you have to keep in mind the scenario. He was in a motor vehicle accident you and no other information is given, whether it was a pedestrian to vehicle accident, whether it was front view, rear view, what type of accident it was. So you don't know what other injuries there can be. So your approach to this patient that really matters. You have to tell that you will be looking for the associated injuries, associated organ injuries. And even if they have spe uh, specifically mentioned that you have to do a relevant uh, physical or sorry, respiratory system examination, you have to tell that in my palpation, I will be particularly checking for the rib tenderness, any point tenderness for any rib fractures, et cetera, any fly chest, like the things relevant to that motor vehicle accident case. One type of the scenarios are this. Second type are those, again, in which the scenario will be given, you will be given the diagnosis, and then you are asked to do the physical examination. For example, uh, you are dealing with a wife, of a husband whose husband is basically a terminal cancer patient and he's being unresponsive since morning. Uh, uh, so your task is how will you confirm the death? And your second task is to disclose the death of the husband to the wife. So again, you have the clinical knowledge is very relevant, is very, very small portion. Most of the students already know what is the critic, what is the clinical knowledge required to confirm death of a person. There are other social factors. What was the DNR status of that patient? Were there any suspected findings? Uh, was this death suspicious? Does the wife want any autopsy? What, have you documented the time of death? Have you properly covered the patient after uh, confirming the death? So these are some of the other factors that you have to address. And if you don't, these are the critical errors and you will fail. The third type of the examination stations are those in which they will not give you the direct diagnosis. They will give you a scenario. And you have to tell the differentials at the very start. You have to tell your approach that these are my differentials and I will be going on to my physical examination, keeping these differentials in mind. And during my examination, I will be looking for the positives and negatives for these differentials. So that's all. Oh, that's very good. And that's very relevant, actually. And um, uh, just uh, taking on that lead of uh, confirming death, it's all going to do with suspicious death versus an expected death. Uh, because is it reportable to coroners? By yes. law, working in the hospital, every death, which is under the suspicious circumstances, we have to pull out the coroner's form. Yes. If you're suspicious, then you have to make a call to the coroner's court out of calls that are out of hours calls are also available and get their guidance on you. And I would exam, I would suggest to all exam candidates well that if you're not sure that the patients have died under the circumstances, circumstances, they've not been reviewed by the GP in the last six or seven days. That's one of the other criteria, and they're not able to certify their death, then you have to refer the patient to a coroner. If you're not sure, then you can make that helpline call and get the cl uh, coroner's clarification. Um, that's a very good point. Thank you, Dr. Saman. Uh, all right. Okay, excellent. Um, we'll just be finishing in terms of uh, uh, some of the communication skills, which I always tell that make sure that, uh, you know, in terms of your verbal communication skills, lots of you have got good clarity, good come out of English. It is crucial. It is important. Make sure that you highlight that. As Dr. Saman is saying, Dr. Mara is saying, everybody can do a stellar performance if you've got given a time. Even a one minute to 30 second makes a huge difference. You've got to make sure that you practice all of that for seven minutes. So having an advantage of one minute to a 30 second, that is the test. You need to pass the exam at the end of the day. We are going to train you to make sure that your information and empathy is packaged in such a way, such a way that all those components are sleeping or seeping in from you in that designated time. There's no marks for going over, all right? What you miss, you, you miss. If you miss the component, you're gone, all right? Um, and having a structure to go through your prioritization list is very important. All right. As we've talked about, we need to introduce and consent. We need to go through task one, two, three, and four. We need to make sure that we complete every component of the task. If the task, the task is about the management, 
make sure that you touch the management. As with the you know rice elevation, we were we were not able to get complete through that. So make sure that you mention that you've got this biological clock in your mind, and you deliberately complete the task before the time runs out. All right, and you do need to summarize. Okay, this is very important. This is the last step. You start the repo building from an introduction, offering analgesia, taking the concerns on board, and at the end when you summarize. When I talk about professionalism, that's the professionalism. Summary, follow-up, squid approach that we talk about. And trust me, if you're not utilizing your time to use that squid approach, you're missing out. And I don't know, I mean, none of these scenarios are out of these world. They're very standard scenarios. They are very simple. It's just because they're time pressured, we're falling apart. But if you've got a framework and you practice the frame framework over and over again, there's nothing can go wrong. And excellent. At the end, give the opportunity that have you got any questions for me? And that is also an opportunity for you. Can you pass this exam? Or if you're missing out a crucial point? I mean, one of the things in the ASM fellowship exam was that, oh, look, if you've not covered something, you can, the actors are not allowed to indulge at that information. Say, for instance, if you are meant to be examining the joint or talking about the treatment of the joint and you've not covered that aspect at all, they will not ask you, so how do I elevate my foot? You need to cover the framework. So that's why I always recommend um, that do your framework early. Look, we're gonna talk about how to assess the knee joint or ankle joint for that matter. We're gonna talk about how to assess the various parts and ligaments and muscles and bones of the ankle joint. What are the different ways of investigating and how can we treat that? At least if you've given that 10 second statement in the beginning, then the actress might be duty bound a little bit that he's mentioned the word treatment. I'm not sure about the treatment. Can I just ask them to clarify and, and emphasize the treatment a bit more? All right, but if you've not mentioned the treatment at all, you're not gonna have that opportunity. All right. Um, and as I said, look, obviously it can come across as very monotonous. You talking, 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 10 minutes uh, or shrinking time, use breaks, even a two second break. Uh, you don't have to say, are you okay? Are you getting with me? Like that sounds a bit artificial. <laughs> you know, it comes to a point, yes, I'm with you. Come on, <laughs> what do you want me to say? I'm with you all the time. Just take a break, okay? You don't have to fill it that with you know, words, uh, just to say. Um, all right, engagement, empathy, we've talked about, we've talked about identification of patient's needs, collaboration, professional giving, options is important. Um, as that Dr. Saman was saying, uh, in terms of follow-up, you know, the further imaging can be done by the patient's GP. You don't have to make a commitment to do the MRI scan or ultrasound scan, because then you have to justify whatever you're doing or what you're not doing. All right, so leave some to the general practitioner. Um, it's almost same like when you um, ask the patients, if anything goes worse, come back to emergency department. We'll do a CT scan. That's my bad. I should not say that because when the patient comes back, he or she will immediately ask for a CT scan. What they would need is another assessment because I might be wrong in their initial assessment. They may have a torsion of the ovary, which the CT scan could easily miss and the ultrasound may be a better modality, which I've not done primarily. So always say that you would need a secondary assessment and that would cover history examination investigation at that point, but offer that contingency plan. Um, confidence is the key. Speaking clearly is obviously in your advantage. Uh, make sure you click all of the tasks. You need to have a methodical approach. I think there's no, uh, points for having a jumbled approach. Make sure that you realize and fluctuate between talking to the patient, talking to the medical student. Okay, so as um, Dr. Fatma was saying earlier, don't use medical jargon when you're talking about HRT. That would not go well. Okay, when you're talking to the patient in a medical student, you need to make sure that you are checking up their understanding. Not every few minutes, but at least once or twice between the session and offering them the consolation that you can always come back to me and we can discuss that even further and offering them some of the online resources that Dr. Fatma was saying at the end. Um, and keep them engaged with empathy. And it doesn't mean that you have to be empathetic like by talking, you can have a posture, you can have nods, okay? You can have your, you know, a little bit of artificialness like holding, tilting your neck or something like that. A non-verbal communication is still a part of communication. 
it's still very much the gist of the exam. So use those cues. And I know it sounds artificial and sounds a bit more bragging, but look, you need to do that. If you need to pass this exam, you need to have all the armament, okay, in your arsenal so you don't miss out on anything. Now, that's the end of the scenario. Most of you who are here who need to leave can leave now, but, uh, but I want to ask if anybody's got questions. There've been so many questions that I am, I'm, I, I cannot have, I've tried to respond to most of them, but if they, I have got a certain questions, like uh, some of the questions, we, so we got basically, uh, the questions were about the exam courses that we're offering. So we've got two courses which we're offering. One is eight week course and one is 12 week course. The core is an evening 12 week course, which starts next week, Monday, goes on for 12 weeks. It's an evening session, seven to 10. And we're going to cover all the components of the exam. It includes physical examination. It includes all the clustered weight approach to all the topics, medicine, surgery, pediatrics, ops and gynae, psychiatric, mental health, communication, everything. It has got nothing different to the standard eight week course, but it's just stretched out. You will get the video course with that. You will get the notes with that, just as you would get with the eight week course. So what's the difference? The difference is mock exams. We're just not able to offer to mock in that price. Now it is on a very good price of $650 till uh, 25th, which is tomorrow. We, we, we nearly good, or we've got very good response. Um, so if you guys are interested, you want to attend this course, be my guest. You still utilize that opportunity. After that, the 50% discount will go away. And obviously you have to pay the full price. Um, you can have an access to discounted mock exam whenever it's close to your exam next year you can book that okay you'll still have that discounted access and that's pretty much it really there's it's very simple and the next question i get asked where do we register so it's emergencyfocus.net it's got everything like honestly if you go and you know sometimes people do register for the free workshops they will get an email and then they will send me a panic message that oh where's the zoom link i said please read the email zoom link is in there if not register again so there's no rocket science i'm trying to simplify i know i know we i mean i do the same thing honestly like when i get the email work i just swipe and delete but some of the emails which are coming from me and you really want to attend the session everything is in the email and it's it's unanimously across the board everybody's got the same kind of problem so read the emails which are coming from our website if you've got a spam folder in which emergency focus is just you know populating the spam folder unspam us go through the email all the zoom links are in there every information is in there and uh, yeah, um, uh, any other question that you want to ask me, do ask me. So this is a 12 week course. And then we've got this uh, eight week course, which is our most comprehensive course. Uh, it is also available in morning as well as evening. Um, it has got two mocks, which I think is a very good way. And uh, Dr. Omara would suggest that, that look, it, it helps you understand your areas uh, where you need more work. And it's a very uh, it's a very friendly mock. It's like a friendly exam, okay? But what we've done, and Dr. Omar and Dr. Saman and I, we did our complete 16 station mock as a second mock with excellent feedback from the participant. That was as close to the NC exam as some. Uh, but this 16 station exam is going to be only going to be for our course participants because obviously we are more obliged for our course participants for core and for the eight week program. So if you are our course participant, you'll get a priority access to our exam. The outside candidates, firstly, they will not get the discount and they will only be allowed if you've got space available. It's a huge logistical task to organize. Dr. Omara, Dr. Saman, everybody was working for weeks to organize everything in terms of, you know, uh, so it, it is a huge task. Takes, that's why the two stations, it does cost a lot of time, a lot of money to organize that. And that's why that eight week course is more expensive compared to a 12 week course, which hasn't got the mock exam. Any questions or anything, please do ask me. If you haven't got any questions, thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for all, uh, all the time and your busy schedule. Enjoy, stay safe. Uh, but if you've got any question, you can ask me now or forever hold your peace and we'll end here. Oh, Sh Shizar, please. Uh, yeah, just, sorry, uh, I sent an email uh, to uh, you earlier today. I um, was wondering if uh, we are 
uh, but there's still like a chance for a catch up for a Zoom catch up. Uh, this is the catch up. She's so, like, this is the catch up. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, I thought maybe like it's a, like a catch up between like two or three of us. Um, so I don't want I want good luck to step rest of the 34, five participants in class anyway, but that's okay. So I was just wondering if um, if um, I can get some uh, like advice in terms of what the utility, how the utility of the two courses, uh, mainly the core course versus the morning slash evening courses mm -hmm. would be in place in terms of uh, helping us and guiding us through the clinical practice beyond the clinical exam because I, I, I understand obviously what we're going to take from this course would be utilized when we step into the real world of clinical clinical environment and we're going to use these kind of like skills in mm -hmm. practice in that space apart from the mock tests and I, I and then I appreciate that most of the course contents have been tailored to address the needs for the clinical exam performance like mm -hmm. optimal clinical. but apart from that which one would you recommend for a person who wants to step into the clinical environment, clinical world, um, mm. apart from the clinical um, clinical niche? Okay, let me be very clear. That's a very good question. Look, AMC exam courses are exam courses. All mm. our faculty are driven to make you pass or help you pass. Yep. Okay. We are time directive. We are role playing from day one we want you to pass yep okay and they're going to help you to address the scenario the content within the scenario the communication relating to the scenario it's all exam yep. focused in terms of the practical skills i know you've got a research background kate was telling me kate curtis yep. um, and uh, you know you need to have that transition we've got another course called clinical orientation course mm -hmm. in which you go through each and everything expected to see in clinical medicine in the hospital setting through triage, patient assessment, management, although it covers most of the topic, but it is hospital-based. This is exam, which is GP-based, hospital-based, communication-based. That is hospital-based, communication-based, disease-based. And we've got no time restriction. I won't give you a time that, look, um, uh, she's our, this is the scenario the patient has come in with an upper GI bleeding manifesting with vomiting and diarrhea which are both bloody hemoglobin is 89 what are your five main top priorities bang 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 okay what are your five main top management skills as a GMO what are you expected to do bang 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 so that's practical from the floor and attendance point of view if you want to get sharp on floor that's that's a must thing for you and it's 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 amazing how the feedback has been. And it's got workshops from that point of view. You've got resuscitation workshop, which takes you in depth from ECG, radiology, um, venous blood gas assessment. So it's got all those components, which even the tools which help you on the floor in the yeah. hospital, they are in the clinical orientation course. I cannot include VBG and ECG and radiology and yeah. AMC course because it's not, it's not the value for your money. You need to pass a scenario. You won't be getting quizzed on, you know, Trifascicular block, but you yeah. need to know trifascicular block means that you need to have an unstable, a stable patient to cath lab uh, for an asperis, STEMI management, and pacemaker. So mm -hmm. that practical aspect of care will come through clinical orientation course. And, and those workshop. and those and those courses are uh, indexed on the the CPD courses or yeah yeah yep. So the, everything is on emergency focus .net. Yes, CPD. If you click, that'll yeah. that'll you can either do uh, yeah, clinical I, orientation. I kind of, I'll find yep, 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 yep. Got it. Got it. That is, got it. I think yep. for someone like you, that would be the best one mm -hmm. to get an orientation for the, um, the for hospital the, way setting. For the hospital. Yes, definitely. Uh, it cool. has got communication. Um, Dr. Jabin is doing pediatric resuscitation masterclass from Canada. Uh, Dr. Sakib is doing cardiology cases yep. uh, masterclass from Singapore. Uh, then I'm doing resuscitation masterclass, which I'm doing tomorrow, day one and day two. And then we've got psychiatry masterclass, which is done by Dr. Javeria, who's a psychiatrist uh, from Canada, but now working in Australia. So it is all very interlaced and interlinked with the practical bits and pieces. It is, yeah. it's amazing. I, so I, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so please utilize that course if you're looking for the practical aspects of it. And if you want to, you know, polish yourself from the exam point of view, these two courses are your get-go courses. We are only talking exam. 
We're very time directive. We want everybody to have a chance to role play. If you're not role playing, this exam is not worth preparing. Please don't waste time in reading the book. You need to role play, you need to practice. Like everybody you've seen have got brilliant knowledge, but it's not coming out timely. It's not coming out within seven minutes. That's at least, uh, remember Omara when she was doing our course, by the second mock, they were finishing their exam at seventh minute time. So that's where we would like to see you. All right, because this is, what's going to, thank you. this is what's gonna get you comfortable. Any other questions from anyone? Yeah, Dr. Rizwan. Yeah, I wanted to ask, like are the days of the classes fixed? Because as some of us has enrolled already in other course, but we are really willing to take your course, mm -hmm. but uh, we are just, you know, like uh, we have this right, like will it coincide with the classes of the other course? It may, it may well, because obviously I don't make my time bill look again, another course. Um, look, I think uh, without breaching on anybody's footsteps or toes, uh, if you're happy with that course, go ahead with that. Um, mm -hmm. Our course is different and the way it's delivered, it's different. We are more role play, we are more practical. I want you to learn the theoretical aspect separately in your own time for which I'm giving you an online course, videos, notes, guidelines. And in fact, what we're doing with our courses is you get an access to that video and reading material. You do that, then you come to our course. So that's the repeat number two. So you're not wasting your time. You're not wasting anybody's time. You're actually repeating yourself and reinforcing the idea. You remember the three repeats? So that's what you're doing. In terms of the days, yes, the days are going to be between Monday and Friday. It's been on predominantly a weekday course. It's seven to nine if you're talking about core, uh, but uh, 10 to one if you're talking about the morning session. So yeah, it is It is going to be between Monday and Friday predominantly. Okay, so someone is, uh, if it, someone is willing, so she can take like 10 to 1 p.m. course as well, like the same course in evening and in morning. Uh, not the core one. Core one is the 12 week one, which is only through um, evening. evening. Yeah. Okay. If you are morning one, we've got a faculty doing an eight week course and we'll cover all that ground. Um, but essentially, it's the same course, the content same. It's just condensed into eight week ones. Okay. Thank you so much. Not a problem. Any other question, guys? All right, I think that's pretty much sums it up. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks for all taking time. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you, Dr. Omara, Dr. Fatma, and Dr. Saman. That was excellent input and insights. I wish you all the best for your exams. Please do book in the dates, which are going to be released on 12th or 11th of November. Make sure you give yourself plenty of time. Grab the date um, if you are eligible for it and go and do the exam. All the best, best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll stop here. Uh, hello. Hello. Dr. Azmiri, you're saying something? Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. I, I forgot to ask. Like, is there any way that we can use to get a date? Because we tried in July, but it was very, you know, like frustrating because it just showed error for 10 or 12 times. I just put my credit card information. They gave me 12 or 13 dates. And mm -hmm. I was so frustrated. Like I was trying for more than two hours. And I was so sure that I could get a date, but I couldn't get it. So uh, I'm Dr. Omara, what would you got to say? Yeah. So, sorry, uh, go ahead, Dr. Azmiri. Yeah, like uh, we tried. A lot of people tried in July when the session was open for the like taking the date. Yeah. But uh, they showed 10 to 12 dates and I, sh I gave them all my information of credit card and all that, but it got error, error and error. So I tried for my PC, I tried for my like iPhone, everything, but that didn't work. So I'm really worried about this thing. Mm. So I'll give you a tip. Uh, mm -hmm. The timings that they said that they would open, I, I booked in the July one as well. So mm -hmm. they said that they open the timings at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And from nine o'clock, I was sitting on my computer and constantly refreshing. Mm -hmm. At 9.58, they opened it. And I had already saved my credit card details into the computer. Okay. So I just did two clicks and my credit card was in and I had booked the exam by 
Oh, that's great. But I was also sitting there, but I, I got unlucky, you know. <laughs> it started. Just make yeah. sure your details are already saved but because by the time you put in all the numbers, you look and you check, that takes a bit of time. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of seconds because I know a friend who was there who was booking at 10 o'clock and she couldn't book it. Mm -hmm. So my only tip is make sure that you have your credit card number saved there mm -hmm. and um, in your computer or in your device, wherever you're booking from and try to get there before time, at least 30 minutes before. And then it's your luck, I guess. Yeah, but yeah. So it's better to save were... it before, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Me and all of my partners did that and we all got the July dates. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Mara. Right. Best of luck. Okay, best, best of luck. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, bye.